Okay, so welcome again. Um, we are here for this uh, um, the project inclusivity. Uh, this uh, project contributes to a more inclusive environment at vocational education and training institutions by creating interventions that want to increase the engagement of underrepresented students in VET institutions. The project is funded under the Erasmus Key uh, Action 2 program and by the French National Agency. It's a three year in duration, so it started in September 2022 and will end in August 2025. Um, the project is led by uh, the Société d'enseignement professionnel de Rhône in collaboration with the Knowledge Innovation Center, the Association for Hungarian Digital Education, the Association of Slovene Higher Vocational Colleges, the Polish Foundation of Centers for Economic Development, and uh, clearly uh, from Obesu as well. Um, basically, the, um, the, the need for this project stems from the fact that VET institutions, if they want to be uh, truly inclusive, they have not only to look at their teaching and curricula, but they also have to look at the wider student engagement. So for example, as student activism, uh, for example, at uh, including students in decision-making bodies, uh, but also at student organizations themselves. So the project uh, aims to uh, contribute to increase the understanding of existing practices uh, in inclusive student engagement, uh, uh, specifically at VET institutions, uh, but also at identifying good practices and innovative ways uh, at promoting increased participation of uh, non-traditional and underrepresented groups uh, and to develop strategies, tools and policies uh, to create a more inclusive student engagement culture. Um, in order to achieve these objectives, uh, the project is divided in five work packages. Well, the first one being a project management uh, as uh, always uh, the second one uh, the second work package work aims at uh, mapping characteristics of uh, VET uh, institutions uh, and uh, look at uh, looks at uh, potential obstacles for student engagement um, the work package three uh, wants to create an action plan that is made of a course to uh, help students review the policies and practices uh, in student engagement at uh, their uh, VET institutions. Work package four um, aims to create a course uh, to support uh, the staff that is involved in supporting intern students uh, who want to engage um, in their institutions. And work package five is uh, the dissemination work package. So basically it uh, in, is intended at uh, um, peer learning, uh, promotion and knowledge, uh, promotion of the project's results and knowledge exchange. So for example, this webinar is part of work package five uh, and there will be a series of uh, multiplier events in partner countries, as well as uh, policy recommendations for uh, European uh, um, policymakers uh, and stakeholders. Uh, now we're going to look at uh, the mapping report, which is part of uh, Work Package 2, and uh, its findings uh, will be useful to uh, structure the discussions in the further sessions um, and uh, as input for the breakout rooms. Um, but this, um, the aim of this mapping report, as I mentioned before, is to look at the characteristics of the VET institutions and the uh, challenges, but also opportunity uh, for inclusive student engagement in VAT. Um, the, uh, the report for now is only a draft, but will be published soon uh, in, on the uh, project website. And uh, it is divided in six uh, sections. The first one uh, wants to define key terms. Uh, for example, what do we mean by underrepresented students? What do we mean by student engagement? 
Um, the second one looks at the characteristics of uh, VET in Europe, and then there will be it's, it is followed by an annex that looks at the specific characteristics in partner countries, which are France, Belgium, Hungary, Poland, and Slovenia. The third section looks at uh, the types of uh, uh, potential underrepresented learners. The fourth uh, section uh, looks at different forms of student engagement, followed by another section uh, which includes the obstacles for these learners. And the, let's say that the last uh, section is a bit more awful in because it looks at uh, success factors and areas of improvement for inclusive learner engagement. As I mentioned before, there are two annexes, the first one being um, uh, VET, uh, the characteristics of VET institutions in partner countries, and the second one contains examples of good practices. Um, so if we're talking about characteristics of VAT in Europe, we are talking about the variability of in VAT systems, for example, the fact that some VAT schools last uh, different years, uh, the fact that examinations are different across schools. Uh, we're looking at uh, different entry uh, points to VAT, for example, in some countries, you, uh, when, when you finish primary school, you're faced with the choice of uh, starting uh, a technical school uh, or continuing with general education. In some other countries, you can get uh, VAT skills by, for example, joining a trainship or uh, within the school itself. Um, and uh, um, sometimes there are schools that are um, specifically aimed at disadvantaged youth, for who have a history of uh, discontinued uh, uh, traditional education and uh, uh, want to get uh, employability skills. Uh, for sure, a characteristic that is uh, common, uh, um, the characteristic of VET that is common across country is uh, its uh, practical emphasis. So the fact that um, it's focused on uh, this type of education is focused on allowing students to get uh, industry related skills so that they are ready to start a profession as soon as they finish the school or even within um, the school cycle. Um, and uh, in some countries, we are talking about an extended VET cycle, um, so like extended uh, training cycle options. Uh, in uh, um, when we're talking about VAT, we're also looking at diverse pathways. Uh, sometimes you have the chance to continue with uh, further education after VAT schools. And for sure, uh, something that we have to bear in mind is the European Qualifications Framework, which sets uh, um, European standards for looking at uh, the qualifications that you can get in the schools and uh, allow you to make um, a comparison between uh, different qualifications obtained across countries. And, the, and so we're looking at also the influence that this has on the VET sector in Europe. Um, when we are talking about underrepresented students, we have to bear in mind that in this uh, uh, project, this, um, this is strictly linked to the concept of uh, diversity. And um, so, and it also it's important to, to note that uh, uh, some students can have, uh, the, 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 um, let's say the boundaries between traditional and non-traditional students is quite blurred uh, because some students may have uh, traditional aspects uh, under um, traditional attributes under one aspect and non-traditional uh, characteristics under another aspect. In this sense, uh, uh, we are also talking about intersectionality and the fact that uh, different aspects uh, interact uh, with each other. And also we have to bear in mind that the concept of uh, traditional and non-traditional is also very con uh, context specific. So it changes uh, the connotations change across uh, country, across type of education. Um, and so the definition is always uh, difficult to have. Here in this slide, you have uh, different uh, types of uh, 
underrepresented students uh, that were identified uh, with the desk research and uh, focus groups. Um, the report uh, clearly acknowledges that uh, uh, diverse learners have diverse needs and um, also uh, that different forms of learner engagement are considered more traditional and um, others are, are considered as the alternative. But as I said before, uh, the, the concept uh, is, uh, the, 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 the forms and these definitions are sometimes difficult because uh, um, the, the, the boundaries are uh, quite blurred. Um, then uh, we can look at the um, challenges and obstacles that some of these uh, unrepresented students may face, for example, uh, time and finance issues, but also visibility problem in the sense that sometimes uh, the opportunities for student engagement might not be uh, very well known. Um, we are also looking at an identification problem, so the fact that uh, um, sometimes the representation of uh, the students is uh, quite stereotyped, and also often the representation of student associations is uh, um, can be wrong. For example, sometimes it's associated with uh, heavy drinking instead of uh, a higher academic achievement. And um, we're also looking at accessibility problems like uh, language barriers and mobility barriers. Um, if uh, uh, we uh, want to, so this report has also identified uh, what could be potential success factors to increase the representation of uh, uh, learner and of, uh, of the students and also to promote uh, learner engagement in uh, these institutions. Uh, this can be done through uh, exactly the, the, the fostering different participation opportunities and to also make them visible, but also to um, uh, by promoting diversity without stigmatizing the learners, by creating a support system uh, for underrepresented learners, by professionalizing teachers for different learning needs and by uh, certainly including these learners in the process of uh, uh, providing guidelines and policies that are not only for them but are also co-created by them and uh, by rewarding learner engagement uh, to incentivize uh, the participation of uh, underrepresented students. Um, as I said before, the report will soon be public at this uh, at the, on the project website, so, so please uh, stay tuned. And um, now we're going to look at the uh, program of uh, the webinar. So basically, the webinar is uh, uh, comprised of four sessions. Uh, the first session and the second session are mostly uh, panels. So basically, uh, what uh, we will be discussing in the first two sessions will be serving as will will serve as input for uh, the uh, discussion groups in session three. Um, the first session aims at setting at setting the ground across Europe, and um, we invited the different actors uh, to uh, share their perspectives. The second session uh, wants to look more um, in depth at uh, the types of activism and types of uh, student engagement that we have in VAT institutions by uh, looking, for example, at how uh, associations and networks are uh, trying to foster this. As mentioned before, session three will include group discussion. So basically, you will be uh, divided in uh, four breakout rooms. Each breakout, uh, each all the participants in one breakout rooms will um, uh, will tackle uh, different topics. So according to the uh, to your choice of uh, topic, you will be uh, you will have some guiding questions. You will have some uh, uh, some input to be able to discuss challenges oppor and opportunities of inclusive uh, student engagement in VAT in VAT or in how to empower students and how to overcome barriers through lessons learned. 
um, how educators and staff can facilitate the engagement of VET students and how to or how to make VET institutions more inclusive and how to invest in participatory processes. So, for example, how to include uh, underrepresented students in the process of creating guidelines for staff and teachers. Um, after this session will be followed by a break and then in session four the rapporteur uh, of each um, breakout room uh, will be able to share the key outcomes of the discussion with the other participants from other groups this will be followed by a q and a's and then we'll close the webinar around one so uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar. And I'm gonna now leave the floor to uh, Sara Mandis, uh, Projects and Communications Officer at VESU. I will also stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Francesca, for the great... Sorry, one second, okay. Okay, thank you, Francesca, for the great introduction to the webinar and also to me. I am Sara Mandis, again, as it was just said, I also work at Obesu and I will be moderating our first session. I want to ask uh, and uh, I want to thank all of you for being here this morning and also ask you again, if you could maybe indicate your organization and change your name. So it's easier for all of us to know what organizations we're coming from and what your role is. And maybe it's easier for you to network and also understand where your experience and insight is coming from. Um, our first session is, as you can see in the program, is uh, called Inclusion and Student Engagement in VET Systems, Setting a Strong Ground Across Europe. I mean, the title is pretty self-explanatory. We're looking forward to hear from all the experts that have uh, been very kindly agreed to join us. Uh, it was really important for us to have a cross-sectoral, cross-sectorial uh, approach. So you will see that we have um, Jordi Stalska, uh, a policy officer from the European Commission, and then Frank, policy and advocacy coordinator from the LLLP, uh, Nathan Weber, uh, our board member of Obesu, and uh, Panagiotis, a <laughs> educator and a good friend of us, and Obesu and this panel. Um, and uh, yes, uh, it's really um, something that we would like to note is that as you might have noticed um, in this first panel, we did not achieve gender balance. Since we're talking about inclusion, even though we're talking about VET, this is something that is really close to a best vision and mission. And it's something that we do put like attention and care into. It was impossible. We have reached out to multiple uh, women and experts in the VET world. Unfortunately, due to scheduling issues, they were not available. Um, it is important that we remind ourselves that this is something that we should always try to achieve sometimes it's a very imperfect process, uh, but we acknowledge that, and you will see that in the second session, uh, we did that. Uh, we did that a bit better. Um, so moving on, I will now ask our first uh, speaker to introduce the, themselves, and to, and I will pass the floor onto onto you. So I will pass the floor now to Jordi Stalskar, policy officer at the European Commission, Digital Employment, working on VET. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, as you said, my name is Jördis uh, Dalsgaard. I'm a yeah, policy officer at uh, DT Employment, uh, where I work in Unit B, dealing with vocational education and training. Um, yeah, and maybe I should say that before I, I started working in the Commission, I worked for years in the Mi Danish Ministry of Children and Education, dealing with VET. Uh, apologies, I think for a moment I could not hear you. I think uh, I'm looking at the, yes, um, one second. Uh, I have a question, Ordis. Do you want us to share your presentation or you're going to do it yourself? I would like you to do it. Okay. That's easier for me. Good, thanks.
Okay, thanks. You can hear me still? Okay, so I just start with my presentation now. Okay, because I, I wasn't sure if we had, should have a presentation of all the speakers first, but I will start then. First of all, thanks for inviting me and thanks for focusing on this very important uh, topic, inclusion in VET, because that is very important. Not least because maybe, and I will say that as an introduction, because otherwise I don't know if I remember to say it, uh, as we all, as you probably all know, uh, vocational education and training is in itself in many countries inclusive because many students that ha haven't got any other possibilities, they can often go to VET. Having said that, we still have to make sure that we have a high quality in VET, of course, but VET is, is in itself inclusion, including, in, including in many countries. Next slide, please. Good. But before we start speaking on VET, uh, I think we have to have a look at the Treaty on the Function of the European Union, also to, to, to make it clear what role we have in the Commission. Because, and, and this is just a part of Article 166 of the treaty, uh, but here you can see that when it comes to education and vocational education and training, it is a member state competence. Because as it is stated here, the union shall implement a vocational training and policy which shall support and supplement the action of the member states while fully respecting the responsibility of the member states for the content and organization of vocational training. So it is the responsibility of the member states to, imp to implement and to decide on content and, and organization. So what role do we have in the commission? You can see that below, because here it is stated that union actions shall aim to facilitate, improve, encourage, stimulate cooperation and develop exchanges. So that is the role we have. We, ha we can help uh, inspiring, encouraging, and trying to facilitate cooperation among the member states. But the member states have to agree, of course. Next slide, please. Good, and having said that, here is an example of, uh, you could say, inspiration, encouragement, direction setting, the European pillar of social rights. Uh, it was set out in 2017. And the meaning is that it should act as a compass for a strong social Europe. I think it's quite important to mention uh, the European pillar of social rights in, in this context. Um, the pillar consists of 20 principles, uh, and I have at this slide copied two of them that I find relevant for education and inclusion. You can see principle one, one education, training, and lifelong learning. Here it is stated that everyone has the right to quality and inclusive education, training, and lifelong learning. So the member states have agreed on, on this. And in principle three, you can see equal opportunities. Here it is stated that regardless of gender, racial or ethnic origin, religion or belief, disability, age, or sexual orientation, everyone has the right to equal treatment and opportunities regarding, among other things, education and training. So the member states have agreed to do this. Uh, and that's a really important uh, signal. But are they actually doing it? That's the thing. Um, next slide, please. Um, the social pillar is more on, on some values and some general direction, direction for, for the European Union. But now here we are speaking about vocational education and training. And uh, so I, I, I think I have to mention for you the two main policy instruments that we, that are, you can say, our compass within vocational education and training at the moment. And they, they have been that for 20, since 2020. Uh, the main instrument is the council recommendation on VET. Uh, it was uh, adopted by the council uh, in November, 2020. At the, and it defines long-term vision and key, key principles for VET. Um, and this council recommendation was supported by the so-called Osnabrück Declaration on VET. It was adopted a week later by all the ministers of education uh, in the member states and the social partners, etc. cetera. Um, and you can say this Osnabrück Declaration is also important to look at because it a kind of, it makes the recommendation operational. It sets out policy actions at both national and EU level. For, 20, for 2021 to 2025. 
So it supports and complements the VET recommendation. Next slide, please. So those were, that's the framework, and that's just a, a small part of the framework because the framework is actually quite complex, but we don't have much time here. But we here we focus on inclusion. So at this slide, I have tried to, to make it clear for you how have we, you can say, included inclusion in the VET recommendation. Oh, yeah, still that slide, thanks. Um, in the counter recommendation, it is stated that it is recommended that member states should work towards implementing a vocational education and training policy which fosters inclusiveness and equal opportunities. Uh, and in Article 17 to 19, we have a chapter on vocational education and training promoting equality of opportunities. And here you can see that member states have agreed that bed programs are inclusive and accessible for vulnerable, vulnerable groups. And we have mentioned here all the different vulnerable, vulnerable groups that we have, at least, but we have, as you also said in your introduction, I think when we talk about inclusion, it is many things. Um, we also, it's also stated that it should, that programs should be accessible through digital learning platforms. Uh, and again, for vulnerable groups and people in rural and, or remote areas. And it is also stated that it, we should look at uh, gender balance and trying to avoid uh, uh, stereotypes, gender stereotypes. Next slide, please. In the Osnabrück Declaration, we of course also mention, mention inclusion. Uh, in the Osnabrück Declaration, there are four objectives. The first one being resilience and excellence through quality, inclusive and flexible VET. And here you can also see that member states have agreed that quality and inclusive VET should provide citizens with equal training opportunities regardless of their personal and economic background and place of residence. It's all, we also have um, a sentence on apprenticeship, because as many of you probably know, uh, in many countries, uh, apprenticeship is a very important part of uh, VETS, vocational education and training. So it's also very important that we make sure that, that uh, apprenticeship is also in, we also, it's also in, in, deals with inclusion. Next slide, please. So this is the frame, but it's up to the member state to do as we have, it is being stated in the recommendation and in the declaration, but are they actually doing so? Actually, we know something about that because as a part of the recommendation from, 22, from 2020, sorry, we agreed with the member states that they should submit to us, the commission, national implementation plans on VET. And the member states did so in 2020, 2022. And in these implementation plans, member states are outlining the actions to implement the council recommendation. And it gives us an excellent basis for monitoring how is it going in the member states? How are they, how is it, are they do, are they reforming VET? Are they making sure that they live up to the goals that we've put in the recommendation and in the Osnabrück Declaration? Uh, and maybe I should I should also remember to say that it's not actually not only the member states, also candidate countries are uh, invited to deal to 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 work with us here. And uh, we have made our two agencies on VET, CDFOP and the European Tra Training Foundation, to make an overview. And from that overview, I can tell you that inclusive uh, and inclusiveness in VET and providing equal opportunities in education and training is strong on all countries' agendas. There's not one country that does not have this at their VET agenda. So that's a good point. We can also see that the vulnerable groups that they cover are, among other things, persons with disabilities, low qualified and low skilled minorities, persons with migrant backgrounds, including refugees, people with few opportunities due to their geographical location and all their socioeconomic disadvantage situation. We can also see that six countries have concrete actions for people with disabilities, and that's uh, Austria, France, Malta, Poland, Portugal, and Romania. And I also have to say that that, that, that doesn't mean that not other, that other countries don't have it, but they don't mention it in their implementation plan. And I think I will stop here because I have spoken more than five minutes, I'm quite sure, but uh, I hope that gave an overview of how we deal with inclusion in VET in the European Commission. Thanks. Thank you very much. It was really insightful.
and yeah. some echo and and it was also very useful i think for all of us which i guess we all know how vet can be complicated and difficult to navigate but we're making peace with that if we're at this webinar um that there are legislations and really a lot of complexities that differ to from state to state and system to system so i thank you again i invite uh, everyone to write down their questions if you have any uh, in the chat so maybe we can address them at the end of the session um thank uh, thank you again Jordi Stalska from the European Commission it was really insightful and it will be useful uh now I pass the floor to Andre Frank policy and advocacy coordinator uh, at the lifelong learning platform and before I let you speak Andre I would like to remind to everyone if you've joined later that we are recording this meeting and if you do not wish to have your face or your voice shared and kind of public I suggest you turn off your camera and audio thank you and now to Andre. Good morning. Hi. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for having me here. Uh, and been great job on how your your project has been developing. It's it's really great to see that we have a lot on inclusion. We are targeting the VET sector. It has still plenty of uh, barriers. Uh, thanks a lot, Sarah, for mentioning the gender parity at, at the beginning. It's still a, a, an issue for the VET sector. So. Um, it's it's good that we keep these uh, these up on the agenda high. Uh, I thought of not having a presentation so I can speak to you face to face in this way. And then I realized that my lighting is not the greatest, so I might blind you with my very very white face. Um, but um, that being said, I'll do a quick intro into the platform myself. Um, the I'm, I'm speaking here on behalf of the Lifelong Learning Platform, uh, which is the the voice of civil society in uh, education and training. Uh, we work at EU level based in Brussels, we're a network of networks uh, gathering 44 other EU networks, uh, including Obis, who is one of our members. Proud to have you on board. Um, and our members work in education and training. It's in, in all of the sector, trying to promote a holistic vision of, of lifelong learning. So uh, we account for the entire learning journey, um, all of the steps that a learner takes throughout their uh, life, representing them members in early childhood education, care, compulsory education, higher education, VET, adult education, non-formal and informal learning environments more broadly. Um, and we try to break silos uh, altogether to have inclusive and, and universally accessible uh, quality and modern uh, learning systems. Um, and I've been with the platform for one year and a half in, in my role. Um, and, uh, and before I used to work with another member of the platform specifically on citizenship education and non-formal and informal learning. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the perspective that I'm gonna speak with you, with you today comes from from lifelong learning, including VT um, in this uh, cross sectorial approach. Because um, even though each sector has its own inclusive challenges or barriers or enables, um, if if one doesn't have a comprehensive strategy that covers all of the different sectors and doesn't have a red thread across all of the levels, uh, it's hard to achieve a mentality change when it comes to to achieving in inclusion. Um, if learners are supported, let's say, to be participatory in early childhood education care, but not necessarily in higher education, uh, then you can see that we're not pulling towards the same targets. And then it's easy to have at moments in the learning journey um, steps where you would fall through the cracks as a learner and not be completely engaged. Um, so this year, we actually worked on, on key competences for lifelong learning. That was the uh, the broad annual theme that, that we, we worked on the platform on. And I think some reflections over this topic actually apply very well on inclusion, uh, specifically because we're going to have a position paper um, upcoming uh, next week. Um, and through it, we tried to raise awareness of the importance of whole of government and multi-stakeholder approaches to learning. Uh, and very much, very much so it applies to inclusion because without having all of the stakeholders that are responsible jointly working together, you cannot quite mainstream it uh, as, as, a, as an objective. And if you don't mainstream it, it's very hard to find opportunities to work together in setting these objectives so that you can have different milestones in one's learning journey on, on inclusion and proportionally achieve inclusion in different learning sectors. And I'll give you this example to, to make it clear what, what I'm talking about to um, self-regulated learning. It, it's a key competence that, that we focused a lot this year on. Um, and it's identified in the life comp competence framework. Uh, and basically it suggests that um, um, learners should have the, the capacity to, to make a choice in terms of what they would like to study, how, using which pedagogies, 
uh, with what type of assessment, using which tools. And this comes very much together with critical thinking, with analysis, competences, because you need to be able to identify existing alternatives, compare them, see what suits you. And therein lies the problem, actually, because all of these elements need to be nurtured. You need to have active pedagogies and you need to socialize these types of competences of engagement. Uh, it has to start from an early age and it has to go through the entire learning journey. So, you know, in each type of environment, how you're supposed to participate and engage, because without these competences, how can you be part of decision making in, in VET systems? Um, if, if this participatory approach then to learning is not embedded and including in VET, uh, then you don't hone the competences and you create a vicious cycle of, of exclusion in this way. Because I think we're working a bit more on uh, accessibility right now. And when I say accessibility, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, for learners with disabilities, but more broadly, uh, we focus on making sure that learners are in education and training, but less that they are included into the decision making uh, over the, their learning journey, um, which is provided a bit top down still in, in, many, in many instances. Uh, so uh, to, to answer some of the questions that you posed to me when, when you've invited me here, um, if there is something that, that you, you need to change is a bit the objectives of learning, uh, to look at competence development as, as a meaningful objective for learning in general, rather than skills acquisition or grading just for joining uh, the labor market, because in this way, then you can empower the learners and then they can learn how to work together with uh, the educators, with the institutions. Uh, the idea, of course, is also to have all of the governmental bodies uh, collaborate because a policy on learning is not just a policy that belongs to the Ministry of Education, but it does have, it touches on employment and social affair, affairs, it touches on uh, environment, if you're thinking about uh, barriers to to, to learning caused by the uh, environmental crisis, or if you're thinking about how learners should engage with the environmental crisis, it counts for the Ministry of Transport, again, for the same type of barriers, but also um, the way all of the ministries actually are connected if you want to create an inclusive environment. And then educators, of course, have to work together with the learners, uh, but also with the um, partners from outside formal education institutions, thinking of civil society, thinking of small and medium-sized enterprises, because Together, they would have the best grasp over what are the learning needs, what are the barriers. Uh, they would have different resources that they can all pull together, uh, and then they can provide opportunities for this type of project-based uh, learning, uh, very, very um, not connected to a specific formal education institution, moving learners outside and giving them the chance to, to experience um, yeah, a, a more broad and holistic vision of learning. And I'll just end with the uh, with one uh, one aspect about what the EU can can do and come into place over here to support the member states, of course, uh, because at the moment VT is split many times between uh, uh, DGMPO or DGAC in terms of different policy portfolios. Uh, you have moments where VT can be used as objectives for uh, supporting businesses, um, like in the European Year of Skills, or you can have VT as an objective for promoting EU values. If you think about the new learning mobility framework that was. Uh, uh, announced and, and where it's it's presented in this way. So, so for this reason, sometimes maybe it's it's hard to see exactly how the work on VET is coordinated with the different ministries also within the member states. So potentially merging together some of the files on VET between EMPL and AAC and viewing VET as an essential puzzle in an entire lifelong learning journey, uh, rather than just as a sectorial element, could be something that can help boost inclusion and could be something that puts the VET uh, representatives and, and stakeholders together with the other sectors to build this type of red thread on inclusion that I was uh, referring to. I think I took a bit more time, so sorry about that, but uh, but thanks. Don't worry, Andre, it, it was absolutely fine and it was very, very insightful. I think you touched on a lot of inter important topics. VET is everywhere and nowhere and it's really hard then to go back to our national realities and regional even to make change it is so multifaceted and so versatile that it also becomes a huge task to then bring change of mindset and practices uh, so i thank you again i remember everyone that is listening first of all thank you if you've joined now we are recording and if you have any questions that you would like us to address at the end of this session please type them in the chat now i pass the floor to nathan weber our board member at obesu nathan are you yes i see you so i give the mic to you Hi. Um, thank you for inviting me. I hope you can hear me well. 
Uh, I will start uh, sharing my screen to present a bit about myself and my organization. And then I will uh, present also on the topic uh, that I was asked. Um, so about my organization, it's called the BESU, the Organizing Bureau of European Schools and Unions. Uh, we already have uh, a lot of uh, speakers from, our, from my organization that I will present later because they are part of the Secretariat and I am part of the board of the organization. So the um, political representative body. Um, so uh, who are we? We are the biggest and only platform for cooperation between national schools and unions active in general secondary education, vocational education, training, and apprenticeship in Europe. Um, and we have uh, sister organizations uh, called ESU and organizations we work uh, with that uh, I know the same work. I will. Okay. Um, so Obesu is uh, an organization, a platform, kind of a network uh, connecting 36 organizations uh, in Europe, not only in the European Union countries, but uh, all over Europe. Um, we have a monitoring committee, about a five representative members, a wonderful secretariat, and other bodies such as working groups and a pool of trainers. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, we do advocacy and representation. We participate to a lot of different uh, events with different stakeholders at different uh, states. Um, we do projects and partnership at capacity building, and we organize events such as statutory meetings, or um, NFL like informal education training events. Um, and our membership, the most important, uh, our membership. We have so 36 organizations, as I said, 31 full members, uh, three candidate organizations, and two affiliates. Um, so to have a bit of difference, the full members uh, have full rights, so they can uh, vote on the different texts and all. The candidates have to wait one year before applying for full membership, and the affiliates uh, do not uh, meet the all of the criteria to be a member, so they have to be independent national representative, um, so that's it. And then that is the board. So we are four representative, we used to be five, but uh, one of the board members uh, resigned, uh, unfortunately. So now we are four and someone, new person will join uh, later or not the next Congress. Some of our achievements, and then I'm finished. We have international campaigns, for example, the one on the left, you can see with OBS, with GSF, and one of our member organizations in Italy. Um, we support the student unions, student unions at uh, national and international level. We do global student forum. Uh, we work from International Climate Europe, which you see is also one of the organizations we help, we help uh, uh, in the creation. Uh, we do regional cooperation, by example, with <clears throat> sorry, organizing events such as the one you can see on the left of the screen, uh, amendments in EU legislation and uh, policy research and multiple avail available resources that are also available in our website, but I'll say more about this later. And a lot of mobilization also in different countries, such as we had um, uh, for the 17th of November, which was only a few days ago. And uh, some other things we want to achieve the full participation of students in educational matters, uh, big attention to mental health, free inclusive and quality education and VT, which is very relevant to uh, today's topic. Um, so now I will uh, share a bit on my side. Uh, so my name is Natalie Bear, I'm part of the board, and I was myself um, a VT apprenticeship student in France uh, as a cook, so in a culinary um, training center. Um, and I would like to present to you uh, through, I would like to my presentation to um, show on how volunteering and activism can support uh, the development of transversal uh, competencies and skills. And I think also through and with the European Year of Skills, it's quite a good opportunity for us to change the paradigm around skills and turn it into a holistic vision of uh, lifelong learning. Um, so through this, I will present a bit about um, my experience, but also what our member organizations um, have been doing in, in the different countries. Um, 
And uh, specifically also about uh, inclusion, I wanted to mention that uh, we as VT and apprenticeship students, um, whether it is on our workplace, um, but also in uh, in our training center, in our schools, we are very often uh, seen neither like a normal employee or like a normal intern, which means we are treated very different from, from the rest of uh, the employees or the rest of the students, uh, which would be in the workplace in terms of salary, in terms of risk or also workers and managers, and even myself uh, doing um, the culinary uh, courses I attended. There is uh, still a lot, a lot of um, of uh, lying harassment uh, only because we are uh, interns or because we are apprentices. And um, because of that, we are not considered as um as like everyone else and um we are not included at all in process and i think that's uh, a big uh, issue because that would change everything if um that are directly concerned but it's happening to them uh, could express themselves they would of course um do whatever they can to um change the situation and not allow that is there is so much um Blowing and husband still being done. Um, so not included also in the decision process in terms of um, the production on the workplace, in terms of the organization of the workplace, which is also very, very important to us. And in terms of organization of our work or to work in general, and in terms of the working conditions, which is also very, very important to me because, um, I mean, especially about our protection, uh, as both at the same time students and uh, workers, there is um, most of the time a lot of um, um, problems, lags that can could be uh, be changed, that could be fixed. Um, but because uh, we are not listening to the ones that are facing those those problems, then it's not addressed and not fixed. And um, about this, I wanted to mention that especially in uh, uh, in Italy, we are we have a two of our member organizations that have been um, mobilizing a lot um, about this because there were a lot of accidents and actually there is a lot of um, uh, students, VT students and apprentices that died uh, last year and the year before that and also like since many years, that's things that happen every year and also in France because there is a lack of um, addressing those issues and especially with the first ones uh, concerned. Um, and of course, the rights uh, to be informed about our rights is a right that is very, very often um, not respected and we are not um, included at all in terms of um, how we should behave in our workplace or even in the school. Um, and um, uh, a personal um, experience to that because when I was in my training center, I tried to organize um, kind of a training informative session on the apprentices and VET students' rights. Uh, I wanted to organize this to the, to the, uh, together with uh, Worker Union, uh, but this was like really a challenge to uh, at first uh, find who are the people in the school that you can uh, try to connect to organize the event, then to try to connect with the worker unions, then to try to find uh, the room and try just to get the accreditation to make it possible. And by the end, they just refused, saying that uh, this is not the place to do that and saying that um, uh, this uh, shouldn't be done by the, the the students themselves, which is which is a big problem because I could see that in, in my classroom, especially there were, and also for me, uh, on my workplace, but there were a lot, a lot of things that were, that a lot of our rights that were not uh, respected in terms of salary, in terms of um, working hours, in terms of uh, working time, in terms of um, also what we should be doing as um, like what is our role in the enterprise. Uh, I was a cook working in a restaurant and sometimes you were asking me to do things that a chef or sous chef would be doing, uh, even so it was not my role. Um, so with all this, I expect, uh, I, I, I hope I was not too long and with all this, I wanted to show that with projects like, uh, inclusive VT, uh, they are the, 
everyday work we do with our member organizations. Um, and that helps to support and foster the inclusion of AT students in, in, uh, in our places and in the training centers. And you can find a lot about our work about this um, on our way, on our website, but also on our member organizations uh, website. We have a police paper on quality VAT and one on European Year of Skills and one on, on inclusivity, uh, but also a position paper on validation and of non-formal education and informal learning. And we also released uh, at our GA uh, this year, the Declaration of School Students' Rights, which also talks about uh, VAT, the, the, our rights uh, as students, and um, of course about inclusivity. Thank you for listening and I hope to answer to your question later. Thank you so much, Nathan. It was a really interesting presentation. It makes us really proud from a best, of course, mm -hmm. uh, to have a, such a great ambassador and board member. Uh, thank you also for touching upon the themes of safety, workplace, whether VT students are workers or not. And we will also delve much uh, more in depth uh, uh, on activism in the second session. So if I suggest that if uh, some of you are, you know, are interested by this topic, stay and hold on for the second session. Again, thank you, Nathan. Now I pass the floor to uh, Panagiotis Mikhail, an uh, educator, also an expert on inclusion and diversity from the LLLP School of Expert. And uh, yes, please, uh, Pete. Uh... Thank you very much, Sara. Uh, I tend to change hats all the time. Uh, I officially work for Obesu, but I'm a member of the Pool of Experts of Life Learning Platform. And I've been working on the topic of inclusion and diversity for quite some time. I'm uh, I'm myself a, a member of the LGBTQI community, thus I've been working on, on uh, uh, gender mainstreaming, inclusion of LGBTQI people uh, across different uh, uh, fields of education, but also sectors. And the most interesting and more challenging, I must say, from the, the different sectors that have uh, engaged in education uh, comes to BVT uh, most of the time when it comes uh, on the topic of diversity and inclusion, because when you think of different educational sectors, the one that you get to better understand is the one that you're part of. And it's easy to be part of early education and uh, let's say uh, traditional general education or adult education, higher education level, but the VT experience or the let's say the, the people who have entered the VT path are kind of unique in their own uh, uh, rights. But at the same time, when we talk about policy, when we talk about decision making, when we talk about co-creation of policies, as Nathan was uh, presenting before, we have a huge gap between the ones that are called upon to create uh, channels, measures, practices, at a national or European level, which many times they're not uh, fully uh, on uh, they, uh, up to date when it comes to the, the changes that the VT sector has experienced throughout the years. Like when I was back in school, I remember that if I don't have a future in general education, or if I don't see myself entering university, my only choice should be or my prim, uh, primary choice should be VT. And I'm very happy as, as years uh, progressed and, and visiting my, my home country, Cyprus, that that stereotype has changed to a big extent, but we're not fully there yet. And, and I'm quite sure when we talk about different ages, and unfortunately, uh, I hope I'm wrong, but in most cases, our decision makers, policy makers, and uh, people de deciding how processes uh, go, like uh, as, as was mentioned before during the first presentation, all member states really care about inclusion and diversity. But the main issue, and this is where I'm going to go with uh, my intervention here, is how do we understand inclusion and diversity and how do we understand it in a sector that we're not necessarily part of as decision makers, as policy makers, as public stakeholders. And that's where the problem starts. When we talk about inclusive engagement, we really need to think and start from the step before. To have inclusive engagement of students, we need to ensure diversity and inclusion within the vocational uh, educational uh, and uh, training system, within the VT system. We need to understand that in order to 
provide inclusive engagement uh, channels, methods, and approaches through our um, institution, throughout the national setting, throughout the, the different settings cross uh, border, thinking, for example, mobilities and, and uh, opportunities for students to engage beyond their own institution or their apprenticeship or any other process they might engage in, is that we need to understand how us as educators, as providers, as uh, stakeholders really provide with uh, measures, with policies, with uh, uh, certain uh, approaches we have within the VT sector in a way that really come to foster and, and promote not only the diverse but an inclusive culture within uh, VT. And the problem here is that uh, this takes more time. Like uh, what I've come to see with the project uh, when it comes to inclusive ed uh, and, uh, and the mapping report is that the diversity can create opportunities as well for engagement. However, we were still at the at the beginning, and and this goes as well with the with the work that the Commission has done, and also to the European uh, Pillar of Social Rights, etc. It really needs to build up in a way that builds a culture of inclusiveness, a culture of uh, really fostering and accepting diversity, both of students, both of uh, of backgrounds of people, but also supporting people who are not. Uh, there because of their own choices because unfortunately we have uh uh issues when it comes to consultants when it comes to really the stereotypes uh of uh of students going towards uh vt because that's the only option we have and that connects the vt sector and what happens within the the sector with the educational levels before and uh and, and it's very important to understand that the culture when it comes to inclusion and diversity for inclusive engagement plays role beyond the sector itself as uh, as VT, and I think this has to do it uh, in general as a as an approach from the what was mentioned before by Andre is how do we really understand the cross sectorial approach and understanding the cooperation between the different stakeholders, which means stakeholders from. Uh, the ministry because different units like in the commission that we have today uh, the unit on vt if we don't connect what the education let's say uh directorate does and then we have a direction within our uh directorate within the employment whatever the culture will build is not going to come aligned or get bridged at some point and it's very important to understand that to be able to talk about inclusive uh, engagement processes we need to make sure that we bridge our education and lifelong learning processes in order to make sure that we empower, we engage, we really foster a mindset of inclusion. And then that affects the different stakeholders as well within the sector. Um, I'm going to go more specific like uh, with the benefits on that. Why is that important? Why would we talk about different sectors and different uh, uh, stakeholders being engaged in a, in a culture of uh, inclusion and diversity. It's very important because in all these aspects, when it comes to specifically the, the VT sector, it comes to really reinforce and strengthen partnerships and collaborations, which is something that not uh, that is very different from the general education. In VT, you need partnerships. You need uh, uh, this cooperation between the school and then the, the providers of apprenticeships and, uh, and learning processes uh, beyond, let's say, the class, outside the class, which is not necessarily the case in general uh, learning. Like I remember in our case, we had one week of, uh, of uh, learning opportunity out of the school, while that's the reality in the VT sector. The problem, however, is that I could really build within the culture of my school a sense of belonging in general education, while in VT, because you have this exit, this moment that you leave your school for certain months, certain weeks, uh, you really have the risk of disconnecting. That's all the process. If there is not a, a, a proper connection, why am I cooperating with a certain partner? Why am I building connections as, as an institution with certain uh, providers? Uh, I can ensure in this agreement, let's say in this partnership, if I have a set culture of uh, inclusion and diversity that 
this is not a moment that you leave the school community, you leave the physical space of school, but that doesn't mean that you need to stop being active, engaged, or follow up activities, which is very important as well to understand. On the other part, uh, it's very important, and I'm I'm, uh, I'm going towards the close of my mind, and I can talk a lot. Um, another part that is very important to understand with this cross-sectoral approach and the culture of, of uh, inclusion and diversity is how the socioeconomic impact is covered by creating this lifelong, let's say, approach to inclusion and diversity and the, the cross-sectoral approach, because when problems occur, we saw this in COVID-19, the expression of these problems or uh, the expressions of how each sector uh, has to go through this crisis and, uh, and problems really different from the experience of the learner and the educator, but at the same time for VT again, is again very different when it comes to, the, to its core because it affects uh, the cohesion of your learning, it affects your, um, your process when it comes to within the school process, then blended formats as was mentioned before, but also your enhanced experience. Thus it creates uh, a problem of how much do we invest when such crises occur and how much do we support as well uh, the VT sector itself in addressing these gaps, these issues, these uh, fundamental questions that no other sector can tackle. And that's where, wrapping up to my point, where the inclusive student engagement plays a vital role. By having a culture of inclusion and diversity across education, beyond uh, certain sectors, and then adapting it within your own uh, sector, in this case, VT, the student engagement really comes and shapes that culture into benefits and, and tailored approach to all these groups that were mentioned before by Francesca, for example, understanding that different groups have different needs. And that goes as well within the VT sector. As a unique sector itself, it needs unique responses. It needs unique approaches that, best of all, the ones that can lead this process are the educators, of course. And I'm not saying the, the only the VT educators, because uh, a partnership uh, is needed beyond the VT sector. But on the other side, the ones that experience the problems and they, they can really find solutions are the students and learners themselves. And I think what the, the project comes to highlight is acknowledging that all VT students are not there just to download information, but they're active right holders of their own uh, learning, of their own, uh, let's say, uh, identity within this, the, their uh, educational path. But at the same time, they can also shape their educational path. And I think that's the more in, in, is, uh, important part in shaping not only their future, but shaping as well the sector in a way that it builds up in a culture of inclusion and diversity, in a way that can really support what happens within school and beyond the school, what happens within the learning process uh, as I progress in my own uh, career, in my own path, and at the same time, being acknowledged as a person that can work with other sectors or decision makers and policy makers understanding what I need as my sector is very specific, as my sector is not a sector that everybody had the opportunity to be engaged in. However, it's a sector that everybody can comment and shape with the risk of not including. And I'm, I'm wrapping up with this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete, for, Pete, for your brilliant intervention. Um, I think we all appreciated those uh, couple extra minutes. There is no problem at all. Um, I also would like to encourage uh, everyone to type your questions. Don't be shy. Otherwise, there will come that moment where we'll have to go through all these little black boxes and hope for one of you to ask questions. Pete just mentioned the topic of uh, agency and not. it's uh, important that we give students uh, individually and collectively, not just agency, but also the spaces and the tool to act on those on that with their agency so they can make active choices, not be stuck in decisions and stuck in systems that don't really serve them. So maybe some of you will want to ask questions about that. Or, you know, uh, I invite also the expert to ask uh, mm -hmm. questions. Ah, oh, oh, nice, Nick. Um, I 
do you i can read the question but also you are more than welcome to open your mic and ask it yourself yes hello everybody i can i can ask it myself as well yes um thank you very much for those uh, very interesting uh, talks we have had so far um and um i i think it has been addressed a little bit already but um, I've been working myself in student engagement for quite a long time um, and also with students from VET. And as I, as I write in the chat, um, I very often hear from people in VET that VET students are just not interested in being engaged outside of their studies, uh, that they are only concentrated and, and interested in their, in their study field. Um, my experience is that that is not necessarily true um, or that it is really not true, but it's a very common understanding. Um, and it's also often contrasted towards to, to higher education, where student engagement is often much more accepted and, 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 and integrated. So my question really to the, to the experts here is, is how can we, yeah, how can we change this attitude towards fed students that, that it is not for them, student engagement is not for them, let alone that it should be inclusive but just student engagement in itself how can we how can we change the attitude that it's not uh, not for vet students need go ahead uh i think i think uh natan can also cover this but uh going back to to some process of the projects that we had uh we had some focus groups and we were discussing about student engagement from the experience of the students themselves uh in their uh, uh educational process and what was interesting in in these discussions it was always based on the on the career path they were following but also the country they were coming from and i i, I wouldn't I, I think in your question i think it's really going case by case or country by country and institution because if in the case for example of denmark that i remember when the institution itself had paths and channels for uh, students to stay connected to their school community, it was easier for them to follow up things beyond their, uh, uh, let's say, subjects uh, or uh, their study uh, focus. While when you were leaving for an apprenticeship or a learning uh, period outside of your institution, if there were no mechanisms or any encouragement of students to be active, there was a disconnection for a long period. And I think that comes, and, and you also need to see the age, at which point they can uh, uh, be part of this experience, how demanding is their, um, their uh, study subject. And that's why I was saying before, like the culture part, because if this is integrated within your learning process and you understand how important it is to be engaged and to be active within your own community, as a community, no, no, not like in your own, uh, let's say, uh, field, that fosters more the chance of being part and being uh, seeing yourself as a as a an important part of that uh, community versus if it's optional. Like you have the opportunity, and it's you know by students for students, while not being uh, either supported or promoted by the institution itself as well. Thank you, Pete. Andre, if you go. Uh, I, I wanted mostly to agree with, with Pete on what, what he was saying, but uh, maybe just one thing to add, um, in a sense, a link to it, what uh, Nathan was also saying about uh, apprenticeships. And I was uh, glad that we can also talk about this because um, the European Parliament is trying to have a directive to ban unpaid traineeships. But it's taking this approach from the perspective of uh, open labor market traineeships, uh, traineeships for active labor market policies, not those included in the vocational curriculum. So there we see another disconnect where we can have strong regulations that would pressure member states to avoid this type of diversity of practices, to have um, rules on how to um, govern access to social security for uh, trainees, on how to ensure that they're properly paid, on what are the working conditions for them, what the support is for them. So this is done from that side, from the employment side. And, and somehow um, there's this very weird disconnect that, oh, but trainees coming from the academic side, they're not the same type of status. It's completely different. That belongs to the competence of, of education. So it's, it belongs to the member states. And I think a bit more can be done then um, in terms of 
splitting these competences up in a in a more natural way and 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 uh, having some kind of directives and regulations also on boosting inclusion uh, that could then address also some of some of your thoughts on this Nick because of this diversity uh, from from country to country how easy it is to have different rules when it comes to engagement inclusion uh, for education and training because of the leeway that is um, allowed to out of the simple reason that oh it's a competence of education it belongs to member state but you can clearly see in this example of unpaid traineeships and, and banning them how this logic is very fraught, very, very difficult to, to reconcile how you can regulate a type of traineeships, but not another one. Uh, so, yeah, some, some thoughts. Thank you, Andre. We have a second question uh, by Isedin Memeti. Um, I invite uh, Isedin to come and ask the questions themselves. If that's not possible, I can read it out loud. Okay, I will take this as a request to read it on your behalf. So, hello everyone. The law on pre-university education in Kosovo provides support for inclusion and is in accordance with uh, world documents. Laws and pedagogical documents are good, but there are problems with the implementation. It's been already 23 to 24 years and they're still raising awareness. So they're a bit stuck. Based on studies in other countries and your experience in developing countries, how long will it take what does it take to have an effective implementation phase of inclusive education in general education? Is there any difference with inclusive VET and maybe a different in timing? It's a really interesting question. And I hope one of our experts can uh, clear it up for you. I don't think I'm going to end light easy too much, unfortunately, um, because what, what I'd say about this, it, it, it's linked very much with, with commitment from your, your public authorities. If you're at the stage of raising awareness for, uh, for so long, even if you have the, um, the written words there in place, there might be an, less a matter of implementation or phases of implementation and more about the commitment that, uh, that the authorities have uh, for this. But uh, it, it really differs from every every type of context, I guess. And I think, Andre, the, the, the case of Kosovo might be a bit, a bit more specific, but the whole process, under, from what I understand from your question, is that if you're in the raising awareness phase, and I, and I think this goes also with what the Commission has on the uh, policy implementation and evaluation uh, uh, um, community, one thing that we always discuss is that a lot of times when you create policies, if there's not a proper implementation uh, and strategic approach in that policy to be you know, uh, implemented, this tends to extend the process of a, of a certain stage of that policy or measure or uh, let's say uh, aim that is being set by either the law or the, the ministries or any stakeholder. So I think the problem here is and that's where student engagement comes, is to say, look, maybe this process lacks specific indicators, specific uh, steps to acknowledge where have we com have completed to a, to a certain extent this process so we can kick off the process that follows. And I think that's where the problems uh, arise when you creates or when you put down a policy and you really want, wish to to bring change, but then you don't really build it up with indicators, expected outcomes, uh, uh, minimum, maximum uh, level of uh, achievements to be able to proceed uh, either in your implementation uh, uh, process or the policy um, outcomes that you really want to have. And I think that's what you're facing uh, as, as a problem. In my perspective, I might be wrong. I hope this uh, answers your question. If I may also add, there's probably maybe a need to have more awareness on a grassroots grassroot level. The Commission with um, the Alliance for Quality Apprenticeship does a lot of work. Obesu also collaborates 
and there is uh, there is value in seeing if your local partners on your territory are aware and to what level and if it's just one person of the group that is aware you need the students to be aware the teachers to be aware educators every single person that is involved in your educational you know institutions and system uh, now uh, we we are going to head into a break but before we go into the break um, I would like to ask you to choose your breakout se breakout session. You will see them now pasted in the chat. There's four groups. So we would just appreciate if you could just also just type the number so we can already organize you and put you in, uh, in the breakout room. They're all very interesting or very insightful. So choose one that you feel like you can contribute and you can give to and take from. And um, I will also announce the break now. Uh, we can have a 10 minutes break and be back by 11.03, um, 11.05 even. Um, so I hope to see all your breakout rooms in the chat and to see you later. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll have to run off. So best of luck with the, with the rest of your conference. Thank you, Andre. And thank you to all the speakers. Um, thank you for contributing. Thank you for, thank you for your making the time and for all the insightful questions from the people that joined us. Uh, just to make sure that everybody's back, uh, again, uh, we are present at the peer learning uh, webinar uh, organized uh, in the framework of Inclusive Ed Project. Uh, as I was before covering uh, inclusion and diversity as a culture in the in the first session, uh, I was uh, in coordination with the team tasked to moderate the session, which is basically covering activism in BT, positive inclusion, diversity, and representation. Uh, and in order to make sure that we really walk the talk. In this case, what we did is uh, we invited uh, basically representatives and, and stakeholders within uh, the VT sector, but also beyond understanding how it is important uh, to not only bring change from within, but make sure that we build strong bridges uh, across uh, different stakeholders and different um, uh, actors uh, when it comes to really inclusion, diversity and representation. So I'm going to present who we have uh, with us together today, and then I'm going to pass the floor to our first speaker. Uh, joining us at the second session, we have uh, Jana Shemali from uh, EFTA, the European uh, Vocational Training Association. Then we have uh, Marco Paunovic and Enrique Martos uh, from Out of the Box International. Uh, we will have uh, later on uh, Ismail uh, Paith uh, Civico from Confederation of European Senior Expert Services. And then uh, a former uh, international officer and alumni of uh, OBESU uh, member organization, Consiglio Nacional Al Elevilor, Elevilor uh, CNE, uh, Delia Glavan. Uh, from this point on, I'll uh, close my mouth and pass the floor to uh, dear, Marco and Paun uh, dear Marco Paunovic and Enrique Martos. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Hello, everyone. First of all, thanks to our host for the invitation. My name is Enrique Martos, as you said. Um, I'm a project assistant at Out, Out of the Box International. I have a background in law and criminology, and I know really suitable for the topic of today. <laughs> and currently, besides working for Out of the Box, I'm also studying to qualify as a lawyer. So cutting to the chase, out of the Box International is a European network which brings together different actors working on four fundamental pillars. Alternative democracies we, in which we try to challenge the status, the status quo of uh, our current situation to try to promote more active participation in, in our democracies, which is indeed needed for, for achieving a real democracy. Also, second pillar is social cohesion and solidarity, in which we try to find the ways so we no one is left behind. Third one should, uh, is economy with social mission, in which are, we are trying to promote uh, social enterprising um, uh, economy that is moved uh, beyond the pure beneficial um, uh, uh, fines. You know? 
And finally, sustainable incubators, we will try to, to tackle all problems also with uh, new projects, ideas, and uh, uh, policy initiatives uh, regarding to green and, and sustainability. Our European, I don't know if, okay, we don't have a presentation, right? I just I will mention it. So our, our European network consists of 34 member organizations, uh, one, uh, more than one, 120 partners and expert pool. Going a bit uh, further in our network, as I mentioned it, 34 organizations from 23 different country, uh, countries. We work with a cross sectoral approach. So we try to bring together uh, from NGOs or businesses to local policymakers and educational institutions. Uh, the way that we like to engage also in VIT could cover different ways and methods, for example, community of practice, cross-sectoral cooperation, ICT, and mostly also active participation. Now, uh, I would like to pass the floor to, to Marco because he will provide you, I believe, a really valuable insight on how we can promote also no formal education, no formal and informal learning. So in this way, thank you all. Uh, Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Enrique. Uh, Pete, I'm trying to share the screen, but it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So I don't know why it is like that. Maybe it would be good to have the screen. Uh, can you try now? No, it says host disabled participation screen sharing. I don't know. Sad. Aha, Thank okay, let me sad. see now. Yeah, now it's perfect. No, yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, let me just go around what uh, uh, you see the screen, I, I guess. You you have the, you see the screen, right? Yes, yeah, you do. Perfect. So as Enrique said, so we are, uh, so first of all, Good morning, everyone. I'm a director of and founder as well of Out of the Box International. Uh, Marco, not... sorry, just make it as a as a presentation because now we see the document. Like this. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, when we were thinking, as I said, we are we are not a vet organization, but our members, some of our members are vet, and generally in Out of the Box, we try to connect organizations which are different and through different kind of expertise come with the innovations in the policy and as well. So, but I think what is important as well uh, here, and when we speak about uh, 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 inclusive wet practices, I think we also need to speak about uh, uh, the quality uh, education. Definitely, when uh, we are planning any kind of wet activities, there are two important aspects before I get into details. So the, the most important thing is to know the target group. And when we speak about uh, inclusion, inclusive uh, training programs, for example, uh, or curriculas, we need to know exactly who are the target groups. Are, uh, are, are we are targeting, for example, uh, people with disabilities? Are we going into the people who has economic uh, disadvantages or maybe some kind of uh, other uh, basis for the inclusion? So that's the most important thing. The second thing is definitely the setting where it's happening. Is it happening in? formal setting, like for example, a school or high school or for example, higher education, or it's happening in free time or non-formal education uh, uh, setting, which is also very uh, different. So I think uh, it is very important uh, that we uh, acknowledge the institutional framework here, because if it's happening in the school, it's completely different context if it's happening, for example, in the activities of NGOs. But always the most important thing is, uh, is, the, is the quality. So. I'm going to run uh, through this thing. We run in our activities quality insurance uh, uh, framework, uh, which, were, uh, which is very important to, to satisfy this inclusion uh, uh, criteria. So what is the, 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 the most important thing for us is to, that we, through all activities, gather the data and we try to improve the process in the projects and also very much in the educational, uh, educational uh, activities. This is a usual cycle of all, all, uh, all activities we do. And I'll just stop in a couple, uh, couple of them. So when we speak about the inclusion of people and activities, I think the, 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 most, the most important thing is really the, the need analysis of the people who are target groups, but also society which, uh, which we uh, organize activity for. I think this is very important. I think from our experience, this is very much lacking and organizations are doing. 
but also we help formal education institutions to constantly uh, uh, do this. Uh, so this is very important. The second thing, when we develop the, 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 the program uh, of uh, different events, uh, we uh, look at uh, if the objectives that we define in the previous step are really uh, developed into are already incorporated in the program. And number three, and I think here what, what is maybe a crucial uh, importance when we speak about inclusion, the methodology that we bring or methods must be very inclusive. That includes active learning, active contribution, and non-discriminatory practice. Doesn't doesn't matter to which target group uh, we are uh, adjusting. Uh, there are many other indicators. I'm gonna run through 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 all of them. Some of them are definitely uh, competent educators and resources available. But what I want to focus on the uh, on the last on the on the last two, which is the learners really understand the whole process and they've been asked uh, during the process what they think about it, especially about the methods, if the methods are enough inclusive. And the last one is that all actors are involved. So if we are doing just uh, activities in the school um, and we are implementing some new innovative methodology, which is supposed to be inclusive, we need to involve all stakeholders in the process and ask them if this is really uh, work for example, for the kids, uh, is it working for the classroom? Is it working for the school? And and so on and so on. So that's uh, pretty much from our side, Pete. I just mentioned a couple of projects and this presentation, people can follow up of the meeting or uh, Enrique can maybe answer later on. Couple of projects, we have disability project, which aims at inclusive education at universities for people with disabilities. We have SLUSIC project, uh, implementing service learning in the schools bringing NGOs and community work to the schools. And finally, something new, we call it MCU. This is a new project that we are starting and creation of inclusive policy processes for uh, uh, for uh, people with fewer opportunities, young people with fewer opportunities. So a couple of pro projects we are working on and we answer the questions later on, Pete. Very well. Thank you very much. Uh, I was about to type that we will be sharing the presentations uh, also from the first session and now uh, when the activity is done, we have your emails when you registered, uh, so you don't need to worry about that. Uh, but thank you very much, Marco. Uh, from what I'm aware, you need to go, but Enrique will stay until the end of the session to answer any questions or uh, react to any points shared by the participants. And now with uh, no further delay, uh, Joanna, I pass the floor to you. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Panayotis. I'd like to thank you very much for inviting us to be part of this important event where we're going to discuss issues that are very close to my heart. Uh, I am Joanna Gemari. I work as a project designer manager at the European Vocational Training Association. For those who are not familiar, EFTA, it is a European umbrella network association representing vet providers across Europe, but our members also include national employment uh, uh, agencies as well as the research institutes working on the field of employment labor market policies. EFTA, it is very important stakeholders in vocational education training at European level, also contributed to human capital growth and development. We are very committed to attain and promote uh, high quality and inclusive education, a vet education that is uh, accessible uh, to, to everyone, as well as we engage in policy and advocacy action aiming at amplifying the influence of our uh, uh, members in European policy making, and we contribute to projects, mainly EU funded projects, that address key challenges related to green transition, to digitalization, social inclusion and diversity, as well as active participation in democratic life. So I was asked by the OS to answer two, three questions regarding how we can foster, what kind of practices we can take to foster the engagement of vet students in vet settings, uh, according to, to our experience some of the initiatives that can be uh, undertaken by uh, vet centers, though these initiatives, in my opinion, should be very context specific, uh, sp uh, should be specific to the context, considering that uh, oftentimes structure and uh, systematic inequalities and disparities are context specific. Could be, first of all, it is to encourage the establishment of student led organization. Uh, this is very important by supporting them through resources and facilities that could contribute in setting up this organization, but also to 
uh, to help them with the grow and to make sure that they would attain the expected the intended impact. So making sure that students are engaged in policy making and decision making processes. So they would provide feedback about the learning process, the quality of education, uh, as well as the facilities infrastructure of the schools and they would contribute, they would shape the structure and the cultural development of the of the schools. Uh, secondly, I would say it is very important to naturalize, normalize diversity uh, in the sense not only by including, for example, represent diversity uh, quotas at leadership level and decision making level, though there I am aware that there are controversies regarding the quotas. On one hand, they might be uh, useful for addressing historical inequalities that underrepresented group of learners face with regard to participation and engagement in the learning environment. But in the same time, there is always a risk of a tokenistic representation. So the institution, the vet institution is to focus more on the representation rather than uh, addressing the underlying, the root causes of systemic and structural inequalities. Um, also, they might lead to a uh, lack of meritocracy, though this is a very neoliberal term in my opinion, but uh, uh, also to a sense of in inadequacy. So the idea that you are being promoted in a position because just you belong or represent a, cer a certain group. Another, uh, um, they should also, another initiative could be they should promote, in my view, a leadership program by uh, targeting a historically marginalized and underprivileged group of learners that are rendered uh, uh, render precarious by, by the neoliberal system. Uh, so make sure that they are included in decision-making and organizational activities or engaged in short-term actions such as projects or workshops or awareness raising uh, campaigns that would align well with their specific goals and interests. But on the other hand, we are part of a project that it is on upskilling vet teacher on inclusivity. And uh, based on the research of the project, we have realized that vet institutions and uh, vet teaching staff, they lack their uh, support, they lack financial and technical support regarding the creation of inclusion and diversity policies at school level, which in my view should be uh, our intersectional responsive and uh, should tackle, as I said, not only diversity representation and leadership and decision making, but also we have an institutional commitment to make sure that we address inequality in terms of uh, participation and engagement in learning environment. Uh, there is um, also um, uh, teachers need to uh, continuous professional development opportunities. So issues of inclusion, concept of intersectionality, the diversity are very poorly mainstream in initial teacher education, also continuous professional development of vet teachers. So they have a very limited understanding and they lack resources, pedagogical materials. And so that, uh, they lack the required skill to manage the classroom, the, uh, the diversity in the classroom. So they need to, to upskill themselves so training programs are needed in order to cultivate uh, the use of inclusive language or communication practice in the culture sensitivity, also to address discrimination, uh, stigmatization, stereotyping, and prevent bullying in learning environments. Um, to build an inclusive investment, to build an inclusive infrastructure. And here I don't only refer to physical aspects or to ensuring accessibility for differently able bodied and neurodivergent people, but also technological, to tackle technological barriers to make sure, especially for those uh, vet learners that have a visual, hearing, uh, or cognitive impairment, also for, for creating a gender inclusive uh, facilities like gender neutral restrooms or sport activities. Um, another issue I think that we have to work on improving the diversity of the teaching workforce because unfortunately there is a socio-cultural hegemony and uh, the teachers, uh, most of the teachers do not reflect the diversity of the student population, but they belong to the white female middle class lacking experience, life experience in diversity. And so those students coming from underrepresented group might not have the, 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 the needed or required uh, role models. So in our view, like uh, those 
uh, barriers that both vet teachers and vet learners first are context specific that vary from one educational institution to another, from one country to another, depending also on the sociological climate, because we have countries like Hungary and Poland, they, they are not very friendly to LGBT communities. So, for example, to implement inclusive policies, also it is a, a very challenging for vet institution and also for, for teachers. Um, uh, and I think that some of the efforts could take uh, could be taken to, to address the barriers. First of all, is to create mentorship programs. So make sure that a weak uh, teacher would support uh, vet learners, uh, would provide support towards not only their professional journey, would guide them in the professional journey, but also in their life journey uh, to provide financial support because we know many students, they fa face financial hardship due to the commodification of the education, marketization of the education. So it's important to provide financial aid and to make sure that they can access education and engage uh, training uh, and engagement opportunities uh, to establish um, a regular communication channel between that teacher and, and students students create relationships that are based on equal distribution of powers, not the paternalistic and hierarchical relationship, and make sure that the opportunities are designed uh, for and from those underrepresented uh, groups. So that's all from my side. I hope that I address the question that you raised. Thank you very much. A very uh, comprehensive approach to the, to the topic, I think very helpful. And and really bringing the the different elements and different aspects uh, when it comes to really uh, the institution itself, but also how to support different, uh, uh, tackling different elements in the process. Uh, thank you very much, Jana. Uh, and with this, uh, I want to welcome Ismail. Uh, I explained that you're running a bit late, but thank you very much for, for being here with us. Um, we're going to go with the with your uh, presentation, we're going to cover all the, the parts uh, from the speakers, and then we're going to open the floor as well, either for comments between the speakers, but also from, from the participants. Uh, Ismail, go ahead. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Pete, for the invitation. Sorry I came a bit late. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but I will speak a bit more about the inclusivity of vocational education and training, how specifically we'll work on it uh, within cases. So hello, everyone. I'm Ms. Mopai Civico. I'm the executive coordinator of the Confederation of European Senior Expert Services. For your bit in context, what we are, we're a network of uh, senior expert volunteering organizations at the national or regional level from all across Europe. We work mainly on two main strands of work. Uh, either one is mentoring and coaching of young people, also of training, let's say, in uh, informal education settings and non-formal education settings at the same time uh, when it comes to um, inclusion in the labor market, for instance. And also we assist SMEs and lots of cooperation and development on a global scale from Latin America, Africa, and Asia uh, in, a, in a very general sense. Um, so when it comes to the inclusivity in itself, um, I have to admit these activities specifically are implemented by our membership and are very different on every national level, right? So not all the countries that we are involved in work the same ways with schools. But one thing that they are looking towards is mainly accessing the rural areas, which don't really have those expertise or those people actually to achieve there and um, help young people develop uh, their, their professional or even personal skills uh, when it comes to after, <clears throat> excuse me, um, inclusion in the labor market. Um, another thing that we're also looking quite a bit, and we are we are exploring mostly because I think times are are so quite recent when this when it comes to volunteering through digitalization. So helping young people through digital means, not just for their own accessibility for people that don't usually have the access again, whether it comes to rural areas or or disadvantaged backgrounds, or sometimes that have fallen out from school. And again, uh, don't really have those uh, in-person spaces to attend, but also for the volunteers themselves. So we also work quite a bit also on the inclusivity side of the volunteers and allow uh, volunteers to also be engaged and, and reach out to these uh, disadvantaged communities to train them, mentor them, coach them uh, for access into the labor market or just in general in, uh, in personal development of those young people. One thing we are currently working on right now also is we're just starting a project called Team for Inclusive Volunteering. So the whole idea for this is essentially um, training young, young people or people in a, in a more broader sense with disabilities to also then become change makers and volunteers themselves and mentors themselves, right? We are speaking a lot about uh, experiential learning and, um, and different um, backgrounds of people and ideas that people can bring forward, especially when it comes to mentoring and coaching and the disability aspect uh, or the identity trait of, the, of, the, of people with disabilities doesn't really get that much highlighted as it should uh, in recent times. And they don't have the space to actually access volunteering programs 
um, or, in, a, or even intergenerational programs uh, with some of their peers. So that's something we're actively working on. Uh, at the same time, we do have to be quite mindful to how we work in these spaces, because again, you also need training of those same mentors that, are, that, that want to work with, um, uh, with people with disabilities themselves. So it's always kind of um, a circular train of, uh, of trainings <laughs> when it comes to mental and people with disability, young mentee, then volunteer, and then come back right back to the mentor. So in our case, we are mainly working on uh, disadvantaged youth from rural areas, uh, especially a lot in Italy, we are doing that. And also at the same time, uh, including people with disabilities as uh, volunteers, and then themselves give out training to either other people with volunteers or uh, other people with disabilities or people without disabilities. It really does not change anything in this project. The only thing we want to do is include people with disabilities um, in volunteering programs. So that's really all I can say about um, about the inclusivity aspect. Of course, we work on other aspects uh, when it comes to industry and SMEs and uh, and formal education settings, but not specifically when it comes to vocational education and training, uh, which is mainly the bit the the inclusion in labour market programs that we have, uh, where people with lots of experience, uh, senior experts that have been 30, 40, even fifty years in a in a specific sector, can share their knowledge and their experience um, and their savoir faire, uh, how we would say. Uh, to those younger generations um, in these formal education settings, usually, usually with schools uh, that we do create these um, these synergies uh, all around Europe, but mainly in Spain, Italy, uh, Greece, uh, quite a bit also, and um, and yeah, and oh, and of course Germany. But anyway, lots of other countries, but those are the main ones uh, have in my mind. So very much on a on a European level um, in this sense. I hope that more or less answered a bit uh, your question on our on our work and, and what we're trying to do. Yeah, uh, very well said. I think uh, it's uh, it's nice to also hear uh, uh, different practices when it comes to uh, trainings for uh, specific groups and also understanding that to provide an opportunity is very different to empower the group in being part of an opportunity. And I think mm -hmm. that's very important to understand when it comes uh, to really the, the thing that also Joanna was mentioning before on the, on the approach of what settings do you provide, but also what infrastructure do you set in order to be inclusive and have the sentiment of, of uh, uh, inclusion and, and engagement in a, in a more hands-on approach rather than saying we have this uh, opportunities and channels of participation, but then not really either uh, providing elements of empowerment or support to uh, a learner uh, or any other person uh, within the, the institution. And on the other side, expecting the ones following opportunities to be able to uh, either outreach or at the same time have the, the capacity or knowledge on how to support a person like a person with disabilities. Um, I just have to share at this point that we're having uh, an issue with uh, Delia. Uh, she's uh, not, to my knowledge, in the call. I don't know if something happened. Uh, we tried to reach out to her. She was in contact with us this morning. Uh, but in any case, what I would suggest is that I open the floor uh, for questions uh, or reactions uh, from the participants. And then uh, if not, we can take also a, a five minutes break until I do the division of the breakout rooms and, and we can proceed with the rest of the of the agenda. But um, I'm quite sure that something has happened because we're in communication this morning. Otherwise, uh, please, if you have any questions as before, you can use the, the chat. Uh, to post any reactions and remarks that you have uh, towards the speakers, either from what was presented by Marco and Enrique, by Joanna or Ismail, uh, or any thoughts about your experiences and, uh, and um, let's say, perspectives when it comes to activism uh, and the session itself. I think the, the session itself uh, allows space for, for sharing between us. Uh... Ah, Delia is here. Okay, perfect. Uh, this long speaking allowed me to... <laughs> to delay things now on the perfect timing. Um, Delia was just saying that you you were running a bit late. Um, and I was uh, blah blah basically, uh, using my my capacity to talk a lot uh, to provide you basically the time to engage. Uh, if you're technically ready, I would uh, ask you to present yourself and um, jump in straight ahead to your uh, input that you have to share. Can you hear us? Delia, are you there? Let me just type. Hi. Oh, okay, yeah, perfect. Okay, if I see your face, I'm happy. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Delia, 
I managed to delay a little bit, like uh, talking nonstop, but I give the floor to you uh, without further delay. <laughs> okay, that's that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, oh, and thank you for the uh, introduction. Um, uh, as I get everyone all <laughs> already understood, I'm Delia. I'm super excited to um to be here. Um. Really sorry for the delay. I'm uh, currently in uh, New York and the uh, time here is uh, 5 a.m. That's why it's also very uh, dark. And yeah, um, so a little bit about myself besides that is that I come from Romania. Um, I was the vice president of the National Student Council of Romania. Um, and the international officer, that's how I got in contact with uh, Obesu. Um, and that was until a few months ago when I graduated. Um, and so because I was not a high school student anymore, I was not um, able to uh, be part of a high school organization. Um, since then, I moved here for uh, my college degree in um, political science and international relations. Um, and uh, yeah, in the meantime, I kept in close contact with Obesu through the working group on diversity and inclusion, um, which I'm very yeah uh, happy to also be representing today. Um, so essentially what I wanted to talk to you about today is just some um, big uh, conclusions we got to draw within the uh, working group um, that also essentially um, answered the question, um, the, the following question, which is um, how can students themselves and their organizations help their underrepresented peers become more engaged and empowered. Um, okay, so essentially um, the first point we could make refers to tackling prejudices, uh, stereotypes, and microaggressions. Broadly speaking, any type of harmful behavior uh, towards someone based on, uh, well, race, sexual orientation, gender, ethnicity, uh, type of education they're uh, pursuing, in this case, uh, of course, BET, and essentially any type of um, harmful, uh, potentially discriminatory, discriminatory criteria. And uh, what we concluded is that it's super important to address the bystanders and the power that they hold, um, especially in this type of situations, because the, as we can see and as we know from history, uh, essentially, and for, from any social situation, is that the choice of keeping silent when violent or aggressive uh, behavior unfolds essentially means siding with the aggressor. Um, thus, it's important to understand the immense power students hold um, in, uh, in this very challenging situation. I think we have a technical problem there. Uh, up, you're back. So you stuck for a bit. Sorry, uh, the. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, I hope this is uh this is good. So yeah, it's important to uh for schools to equip them with the tools necessary to uh chat to um address the these very challenging situations, um, and. Yeah, so we thought about how schools can do that, and it can be actually done in uh, many ways for schools to foster this culture uh, of understanding and acceptance. And some of these are dialogue, debates, workshops, cultural exchanges, um, awareness campaigns, and many others. Um, the point is, um, what we want to highlight here is that it's important to react effectively uh, when any type of discrimination unfolds, um, even if it's our group of friends, teachers, parents, or literally any other, any uh, other person, uh, because a, a 
creating an uh, inclusive environment requires active participation from all members uh, of the educational system. Now, uh, we actually took this step, uh, we actually took this a step further and we thought of why is it that VET faces um, discrimination at such a high rate, essentially everywhere, not necessarily in certain parts of Europe, uh, within Obasu, I got in contact with so many people uh, from literally uh, any part of Europe. And so we could notice that this type of discrimination is present everywhere. And essentially, we can even um, talk about how this very Eurocentric uh, curriculum that we have um, essentially is rooted or has some sort of um, underpinnings in any type of um, discrimination that's not very Eurocentric, or it doesn't validate the uh, education that uh, maybe um, affirms any, um, yeah, any other culture or global heritage that we have. Um, so yeah, maybe we could even take this a step further and think um, think of it in that um, kind of um, area. Um, but yeah, in the end, what I really wanted to point out is that recognizing um, the multifaceted identities of students is fundamental uh, in this um, and fundamental essentially in policy making because intersectionality acknowledges that their experiences are shared not only by their uh, type of the type of education they're pursuing or gender or religion or so socio uh, economic status um, or any other thing of the kind um, inclusive policies embrace this complexity um, and they address the unique challenges faced by each individual. And that's what we should look at. Um, essentially this approach just fosters uh, a sense of belonging and validating uh, uh, the entirety of a student's identity. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Delia. And once again, thank you so much for, for joining us. I had a small heart attack, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, I was like, what is happening so, also in the other side of the world? It's like, it's not that you can ask anybody around. Uh, uh, I said like 30 alarms. Uh, so. We really appreciate I'm it. Like... Uh, highly, highly appreciate it. Uh, as we appreciate the, the engagement of all the speakers, of course. Um, and with this, uh, I want to thank all our speakers uh, or all the representatives for their interventions. And uh, if you would like uh, to make any remarks or, or highlight from uh, anything that was mentioned by other speakers, or if our participants would like to, to share any reactions or uh, comments or questions, uh, the floor is open for everybody. Um, so you can, of course, uh, uh, type your chat, uh, raise your hand and take the floor if you wish to. Uh, but what I would like to comment, I think, the the very interesting part starting from uh, in the end starting from uh, out uh, of the box international approach on the quality assurance is really like how do we think our approach in education and really the connecting the the learners needs with the resources and tools we use going to Joanna in the aspect of uh, um, uh, okay. Uh, I'm I'm gonna react to Alidia's message, uh, which actually makes sense. Uh, in the latter point, uh, I got a direct message. Sorry, um, but also in the part of uh, thinking that the the context of VT as a as a system and acknowledging the diversity of groups, but also diversity of approaches that we need to have in building up a supportive and inclusive approach in how. We provide uh, and what do we provide to students to be engaged, to be really not uh, uh, aware of opportunities, but be immersed within these opportunities to to really uh, shape 
uh, their learning development and uh, and personal development in the in the whole sense of being engaged and rather than uh, participate without uh, any support or any other um, meaningful ways. And, uh, and I think what Jana was also putting down uh, built next with with what uh, Dele was saying when it comes to uh, the work that the, the working group has done with certain perspectives, biases and uh, and prejudices, which no matter what methodologies and approaches you build up, you need to make sure you're also aware of your surrounding, which is very different of what happens at national level because of certain stereotypes, which the VT sector suffers itself a lot of stereotypes and needs to overcome a lot of stereotypes many times, either for the quality of education it provides, either uh, the expectations, for example, the, the process now, and, and John, I think you can uh, react on that. When it comes to the part of uh, VT excellence, like we need to run and, and really approach the European perspective of VT sector should be while risking of leaving people behind uh, without ensuring that this excellence doesn't also compromise the ones that are already being stigmatized or being pushed back uh, uh, at the local level. And I think this is, with everything that I was saying, and, and last Ismail, with really the, the, um, the perspective on all these elements, understanding how can I support the learner or the educator in an opportunity, but also building up the person as an individual, to really uh, experiment in their full potential, that opportunity is very important as well. And that's what altogether shapes the, um, the, the process uh, of really immersing uh, activism within the, the VT sector, but also promoting and, and really putting forward uh, meaningful, inclusive engage, uh, student engagement processes. And uh, Without no questions and uh, my skill of not stop talking, uh, I think I will wrap this session up. I got a suggestion to, instead of have the breakout rooms, uh, to have an open discussion per topic here. Uh, if everybody's okay with that, we could do that. And as we are, uh, we had around 45 registrations uh, of people to join, but of course, uh, many things happen. Uh, we are not such a big group, so we could actually, if you're okay, uh, cover the topics and uh, and share with the Jamboard. Uh, I, what I could do is uh, uh, give you some time uh, with the Jamboard, which I'm just gonna post on the chat. Uh, but before doing that, before going to the next session, I think it's appropriate to thank all the speakers, because uh, I know some of you need to, uh, leave us uh, as you have uh, other obligations, but you're more than welcome to stay until the point you can uh, for the discussions that we have uh, within the, the four working groups. Um, and we're really thankful for your uh, both uh, interventions, but also uh, the support you have provided us uh, during the activity. Um, their presentations, the ones that they were shared, they we're gonna share them uh, with the finish of the activity. And of course the recording Will be shared on uh, on the web uh, on the website of Inclusivet and uh, with the speakers themselves if they wish to further promote them. Uh, and going now, uh, closing session two, uh, we go to session three, which is the the group discussions, uh, which we're going to make as a group discussion. But before that, what I would like us to do as an exercise, because that was the the idea with the rapporteurs, is I'm going to uh, share with you the. Jumpboard that we have created there, you will see. Uh, I'm just copy pasting the link on the chat uh, so you can access it, but I will also share my screen uh, for everybody to see. And I will explain you how uh, we. Uh, oh, yes, now you can. You do see the Jumpboard, right? Because I always have the people in front of me. I. Uh, uh, okay, so. Uh, we have taken some notes, if you've seen the Jamboard, uh, some uh, key remarks from session one, key remarks from session two. And what we were uh, proposing for the group discussions is that you have some guiding questions and we will give you some time as uh, individuals to address those questions yourself. And you can, of course, go uh, per topic. So we have on uh, session uh, on uh, sorry group one challenges and opportunities for, of inclusive uh, student engagement in VT. Our main guiding questions were uh, based on uh, your field of work. What are the challenges you face and 
or are aware uh, when it comes to inclusive student engagement, what are good practices, policies, measures, uh, et cetera, related to, the, to this issue, the, the ones that you're mentioning in the, as, a, as a challenge, and um, that you might be aware either from own experience or uh, from uh, research or work you have done uh, beyond your institution, and what would you need to overcome some challenges? Because something that was mentioned as well in the sessions before is uh, how important it is to really uh, invest and allocate resources when it comes to uh, certain processes. And we uh, thought it's important when it comes to uh, understanding the overcoming challenges that is not about a methodology itself. Many times what we lack to understand is that we need either uh, financial resources or material resources or training capacities. Um, thus do uh, brainstorm on that level as well. Like, I know the problem, I know the solution, but how can I shape this? How can I, what does my solution need to, to take form? Uh, then we have uh, the second group, which is empowering students overcoming barriers through lessons learned. Uh, our guiding questions here are what are the barriers and how students empowered uh, can help overcome them? It, student empowerment can help, the, help them overcome them. Based on your field of work, what are the effective ways in empowering vulnerable students and fostering inclusive engagement? Can you share specific examples from your own experiences, project outcomes, practices you apply in, at your institution, class, etc.? Then we go to group three, educators and staff facilitating engagement of AT uh, students. We have, what is the role of educators and staff in inclusive student engagement? What do you define as an educator in the VT sector, uh, which is also building up from the discussions we had before? Is there a need to involve stakeholders beyond the institution itself? And what are the necessary channels and tools that should be accessible to educators and staff to perform better? if applicable and why so. And then last but not least, we have the group four, making VT institutions more inclusive and investing in participatory processes that foster students' sense of belonging. With guiding questions, what do you define the meaning of making more inclusive participatory processes and sense of belonging? Uh, this will be more easy in a discussion process, so you don't need to really put on the post that uh, what is the, the meaning of each, uh, but, uh, we do welcome you to write some good practices, policy measures that uh, you are aware of when it comes to these uh, processes. And of course, uh, if you can help us with identifying the key stakeholders mentioning earlier as well in the, in the first session, and what is their role when it comes to uh, really uh, helping the institutions moving closer to this, uh, these targets. So what I'm gonna propose now is that you can go to the Jamboard, you can select uh, the focus, uh, the, the theme, the thematic that you wish to elaborate individually, and then we can come back all in and go through each post and the and the discussions we have done. That will be the process in the discussion group itself. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna give you until uh, 12 to kind of go through the each uh, Jamboard uh, when it comes to session three, look at the questions, share what you have to uh, to share if you wish to, and then we can come back and discuss further. Uh, you can put keywords, you can put uh, parts, which also means we can also skip the session forward, which was discussing the outcomes of the of the group discussion. So we can do that later on, uh, but we can further elaborate uh, in 10 minutes. Is, is that okay with everybody? Is the task clear? I'm shaking your heads or reacting? We don't have access to the Jamboard. Open uh, the access. I will do that, but is the- okay. One by one uh, is my one by one. Uh, I don't want you to have access until I'm sure that I have. Um... I need to change this, right? Okay, sorry. And then, voila. And now you have the proper access here. Here you are. But when it comes to the process itself, uh, the link should be working now. Yes, I see people entering. Perfect. Uh, is uh, I need to see your faces. Is it clear? Like we start now, fifty-two, uh, and we say that we come back in uh, in ten minutes, fifty-three, and you have the time to go uh, from basically what it is, page uh, three to page. Six, uh, you know how to take post-its. You press this button, sticky notes. Uh, you write uh, your uh, your note there. And then when, of course, we go, uh, when we come back and we go through the, the slides, 
if you wish to present uh, your intervention or your contribution, we will go through it together uh, in 10 minutes. Is that okay? You need to react. Do we need to do an energizer? Because like I see everybody looking at the screen, but no. Ah, thank you, Pelin. Like that's a reaction. <laughs> I can understand. Like okay, so I'll uh, at this point I'll post the recording, so you have your own time to write and uh, and act. Because uh, we did say this part is not going to be shared, uh, recorded. Sorry. So what I'm going to do is. You can raise your hand. Is the reactions? Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. I can go on, Sarah, if you want. Belin, I, I see that you're you are muted, so I'll let. The... Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So one of the challenges that we face here is the um, work and study organization and rare presence at our campus. So the students, our learners, are thinking that they are usually going, and why they are they are not feeling. Uh, really included because they don't have enough time in the school. So I wrote a possible solution also. We don't have this kind of strong link yet, but we can create some links between their working organization and also uh, between our uh, school. Um, for example, for the hairdressing department, we can do some um, one student made a donation of hair for the cancer organization. So it was a really great organization and a great um, thing that she did. So why we cannot do this uh, with our school and with the working organization together for more other, um, other more opportunities. Thank you, Pelin. I now pass the floor to Enrique. Hello. So um, I was involved in uh, this disability project that we, in which out of the box uh, uh, is a partner. And something that I re uh, realized on it, we were trying to to promote uh, people with visual and hearing impairment to engage uh, at high education, a higher education, and also to promote the accessibility so of the of of the lectures and everything for the their uh, their situation, and something that we found really. Um, controversial or, or, or difficult to approach is um, to be able to, to make it accessible maybe for um, with a label in pictures so they can read it with the programs that they have and every people that, can, that cannot see the picture they it needs to be explained to them uh, what is there so we found that to be able to do this is really expensive so this is a really ch a big challenge like how to how do you make it accessible if if which means do you need to make it really accessible how it could be able to be promote this accessibility because it, it's really beautiful say yeah everyone should be but then who is providing you the help to make it that possible so i just wanted to bring that to, to the table and make, and make the awareness of the cost that it has to make for for people that really need this accessibility the the their, their cause, yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you, Enrique. I now pass the, the floor to Nick. Uh, thank you. Um, just one, one, one challenge that I, I wanted to share um, based on, on, on my experience in uh, working, especially with vet schools, is that there is often this perception of hierarchies which is quite strong, maybe stronger than in, in, in other areas of education, um, where so the sense that students are not really supposed to speak out because teachers know better, um, even more so if we talk about younger students. Um, and I think at least I have seen some experiences where, um, where the, the school really actively encourages this sense of um, this culture of everybody's equal, everybody is valued. Uh, even if you're less experienced, you still have a very interesting and unique perspective, um, which, for example, teachers might not have. So it's very much about culture. And I just want to share one example, because as I mentioned earlier, I often hear that 
maybe students are not interested or they're not able to engage. Um, I worked in Scotland on student engagement for a while. And there I worked at schools where um, they had um, uh, students engaged from all different areas, including special needs learners. Um, and even special needs learners were 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 actively engaged um, with the support from staff. So if you see that in a school, that no matter what is your 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 level, what is your age, then I think it it really encourages the the sense that everybody can uh, can can contribute. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick. Also, interesting point about age and uh, maturity, I guess, in a way. Uh, if uh, we are happy with the contributions to this uh, first topic, I would suggest to go on to the second uh, page of the Jamboard and uh, and look at empowering students overcome, overcoming barriers through lesson learned. If there is, again, one of you that has contributed you know, a lot to this and wants to share, you're more than, more than welcome to take the floor. Again, just give me a sign, some kind of sign. I see no signs, uh, but I can maybe look at a couple of the post-its and start to spark this conversation. So I see that in this second yellow post-it, we have getting them involved in decision-making processes. So empowerment, involvement, and uh, how do we get people that don't feel represented to feel like they have the agency, they can take full control of the situation and make their voices heard? I don't know if any of you has some, I mean, I'm sure some of you, all of you, if it's not, have experiences either as a, you know, from different sides or from different perspective. So this is your time to shine and really give us that uh, practical knowledge. It's okay, we're all tired. Um, I am gonna go and then look at another one. Um, okay, actually, I think there is kind of an answer. Another yellow post-it, I think is a third, uh, second on the right side. There is effective student engagement needs active facilitation from support staff. For example, support students want to be active and organize activities. If I may contribute, unless anyone wants to, you know, uh, take the floor for me, which you're more than welcome to do. I guess it uh, can look like having like having a physical space, having a set amount of time every week or every month when students can gather. In some educational system, this is uh, this is already a thing. I guess that's uh, that's the case in Italy. Every high school needs to have uh, class assemblies, uh, school wide assemblies. Um, but there could also be uh, a digital space, as Pete is suggesting this in the in the chat, um, which can be a page, a consortium, a collective that kind of gathers people from different geographical locations. Um, that's uh, that's maybe a way that we can all agree that can uh, empower this uh, more effective uh, engagement. Kind of yes, uh, Pete, uh, please jump in. Uh, I think I see a post-it which uh, calls upon my uh, external affairs position uh, when it comes to uh, getting them involved in decision-making processes. And I think this connects to the, the discussions we had earlier. VT sector being so unique and, and really having people many times, not from the, the sector itself, or acknowledging how the, the uniqueness of VT works when it comes to decision-making and policy-making. And that could be either as an institution uh, across the different uh, subjects or in the engagement across the different lives of students in uh, in their own school community, but also in the relation of the school community with the overall community. It's very important. I think that was, uh, what, that was what Nathan uh, Nathan was uh, covering is having them participating, having students being engaged and being part of decision-making processes, be that uh, uh, common activities on the overall uh, program of the institution, uh, policies and approaches, also what was covered before for Kosovo, for example, in you up there on the national level, setting a, a, a policy process with whatever plan or program it might have, the one that is gonna be able to reflect on it and its impact is gonna be me as a student. 
thus having me within the process of decision making or uh, not just to consult me, but being part of that process with you as a stakeholder provides me the opportunity to not only come and, and implement something you've got created, but co-manage. And I think that's key part that we also see, for example, in the, in the Council of Europe when it comes to the, the youth department, co-management is very important there because we don't come to reflect on things that have been given to us, but we come to shape them based also on our realities. And and I think this also covers the point of Nick before, like a lot of students, or we what, what you've heard, like a lot of students are not being engaged. If I don't see an opportunity of something being adjusted to my needs, what are the chances that I'm going to feel the need to participate or engage at the extent that uh, anybody would expect me to do so? That's also the difference. Like By giving the opportunity to shape something increases my interest to participate or at least the opportunity to, to go against, like Nathan was saying, like we were protesting, which means that I know that by protesting, I'm going to have a set result. And, and that I think by ensuring they're in the decision-making process, you bring this barrier that I need to react for something to take place. But at the same time, we make sure that whatever progress happens, happens steadily by inputting uh, the perspective of the students. And I think that what the project does as well, like acknowledging how inclusive uh, uh, inclusive student engagement matters for that as well, like the impact and the change within the system. Thank you, Pete, for your contribution. Um, I will again <laughs> refer to you. So. Uh, one more time to contribute. It can be in the chat. It can be, you can uh, also just send me a direct message if you don't feel like doing the public speaking thing today. Um, if not, I will go over a couple more post-its and then we'll see how we're feeling and if we want to contribute. Um, okay. I see a point, the green post-it on the bottom left side about career guidance. I think this is relevant, especially when we're talking about VET barriers, access to employment, but also access to quality education, which was mentioned quite a couple of times. I will read it out uh, very quickly. Provide a good career guidance with policies that give adequate uh, structure of guidance that support teachers in their daily work. Uh, this is very interesting. I thought it was going to be more about student career guidance, but we should also make a point that educators and teachers and all those professional figures that do end up becoming or acting as educators, even though maybe they don't feel empowered to call themselves that, in VET uh, have to navigate a really complicated system where they have to be an educational kind of mentor or tutoring or tutor for VET students, but they don't necessarily have that themselves. So to navigate this really complex policy framework, school regulation, school culture, it can be very overwhelming. The pay of teacher is what it is. I don't think I need to kind of uh, ex uh, expand on that. In some countries is very bad. In some others is a bit better, but still. There is there is a lot of, um, this is a key link. This is a key person, a key figure. And uh, perhaps we're not uh, fully setting them up for success if we ask them to figure out the policies, explain it to students, explain it to their head of schools or head of department, and then also act on it. Maybe this is not just a one person, a one person's job, and there maybe there, we could look into ways in our own uh, organizations and when we are in contact with other stakeholders and in projects like this to provide a framework where we identify that uh, uh, I see Pete is uh, contributed. You're you're more than welcome to kind of uh, explain. I'm thinking a little bit about the the concept of of career guidance is is what I was mentioning before about the culture and the connection of the different education uh, sectors. Like when you're in primary school, a lot of times, like I remember from my generation of uh, if you're horrible by sixth grade, the career guidance will be, okay, look, you're not good with uh, uh, modern Greek or you know all the philosophical things. You go for technical school uh, because that's your only opportunity to finish school. And for me, like, without any test, without any real consultation, without understanding like, what does this give to my future? What does this give to my uh, personal and, and professional uh, development? Really like, you know, it could push people towards uh, paths that, not that VT is bad, but into paths that they don't, themselves don't choose just because they are less than or because the 
the practice is uh, is done as such. Um, th that's why I mentioned as well. Like I was happy to see in Cyprus that this practice from career guidance providers has stopped because if it was justified why I should go towards the I, I didn't. I'm saying an example of my brother, for example. Both my brothers were moved to VT and then they didn't finish school because they didn't have proper support when it comes to to career guidance. And and for me, like when I see myself and them, it's like I cannot blame them for not finishing school because they were literally pushed in VT because they were seen as problematic kids. As if VT is a sector that you're sent there to resolve your uh, your reactive personality. While now VT has been cherished and, and really valued on what you learn in your profession and the path that it has to give, uh, it can give to you. And I think that's important when we really foster uh, how do you call it um, career guidance to be more lifelong learning like you're going to leave primary education you're going to go to VT whatever sector you go there is a continuation you don't just finish take a degree and, and you're done there is a transition from primary to VT from VT to uh, higher professionalization and this is the element we were missing a lot and, and I think this is what also at European level is becoming more mainstream how career guidance can really support the process of uh, of lifelong learning and how you can really cut off any aspects of uh, of personal inspirations or development in, in the way that either can contribute to stereotypes of VT or really help us um, address them in a in a more truthful way. I have also Thank something you. to comment. Again, if I, I, uh, everyone and anyone. Sorry, can, can you hear me? Like, if I can share something also, if we have time, it would be great. So, uh, yeah, in, in this line, I would like to also comment that we... Can you hear me well? Erika, we cannot hear you. No. Now? Now you can hear me? I can hear you normally. Okay. Okay, great. So yeah, in this line, we also in Defability, we provide training for uh, for the, um, the employers, so they feel uh, comfortable uh, hiring people also that maybe could have some impairments because maybe uh, these employers don't ha don't have the the capacity or the understanding for make it the work accessible for. For uh, for for these people with different abilities, so we also guide employers in a training for making that possible, and so they feel comfortable hiring people and they have the capacity for it. So we try to to make quality there. And I wanted to share in what uh, Pete was commenting before, an example that pop up in my mind in in Spain is a project called Mentores. Uh, I don't know the organization right now, sorry for that, who is implementing it, but uh, basically the project is is about, um, they took people from secondary schools from Madrid and, and Barcelona with, with fewer opportunities from disadvantaged backgrounds and then provide them for them um, good, uh, a, a mentor uh, free free cost mentor that help them more in maths, in science, and also uh, a couch that help them with uh, confidence, with with uh, boosting their self esteem, and in the end of the year, the the uh, the data shows that they really increase their their grades and their outcomes in those in those uh, topics and also they felt really um, uh, ca capable of that so they boost also their self esteem and the and their opportunities and as and, and as uh, Pete was commenting they could change that label that they had on their sales that, oh, I'm not good at it. I'm useless for that. I cannot take this, this branch. And they open up a way more different opportunities in which they could really um, cross and experience because they have they felt comfortable for it. In this sense, I just say that many of us 
I say that we had the opportunity to have uh, mentors uh, and at the school, like we pay maybe private classes for maths. I was, for example, horrible at that. So I really need extra help on it, but I could uh, afford it, no? So in this program, they gave uh, these mentors for people that they couldn't really afford it. So they wouldn't do it anyway. So they had the opportunity for that. And also the mentors, I forgot to comment, they were online. So could, they could reach anyone in that who could have internet, maybe in a free spot or say, uh, to have the classes and stuff. And the, the classrooms, they were just focusing two people per classroom. So they really was individual classes in for, for groups of two. So yeah, just, just I wanted to comment that. Um, I, the outcomes were really, really interesting and nice. So thank you. Thank you, Enrique, for sharing. This was really insightful, really also, I think, uh, a really positive contribution that makes us really hopeful for the future of ET and mentorship. And of course, inclusivity and equality and also addresses socioeconomic differences mm -hmm. in backgrounds. Now I pass the floor to Francesca and she will go over the third group. Hello again. Um, so now we're looking at um, how educators and staff uh, can facilitate the engagement of uh, VET students. And uh, I want to leave the floor to anyone who feels like contributing. Uh, I can see that uh, Nick has made a comment in the chat. Uh, maybe, uh, Nick, do you want to uh, tackle the comment yourself and take the floor? Yes, yeah, I, I also didn't want to speak too much, but um, I, I, it has been just a, a more of a general observation that that very often schools um, are very good in in actually facilitating um, certain uh, unrepresentative groups, especially when it comes to disability needs, but also other areas like mentoring. But generally, it's only available within the classroom. So I've seen examples where. Uh, for example, uh, support to, to deaf students, having a translator uh, was available in the classroom all the time, but that student was not able to, um, to say, get involved in, I don't know, student council or do other uh, uh, extracurricular activities, or even in, in her internship, this was not available. And that really caused a lot of problems. So that, I think, is also why often... Um, student engagement in the, in the, in a broader sense is less inclusive than the classroom itself so that's why i wanted to point it out um, because i think also in, in line with this this next session the group 3 one uh, support is is quite essential to encourage learners in 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 in, in everything including student engagement i couldn't agree more i think this is a very fair point and um, in fact, I think that uh, sometimes teachers themselves are not uh, informed about uh, the possibility of uh, um, helping students uh, to engage outside school. So firstly, uh, there should be uh, an effort to um, tell them that there are opportunities and then uh, help them also in communicating these kind of opportunities uh, to uh, their students. Um, and regarding this, I see another comment that could relate to uh, to what we have been talking about. Sometimes uh, the, the teachers feel overwhelmed and uh, they do not uh, they feel that they do not have the time to uh, tackle issues that are not um, related to curricula. And uh, for example, there's this um, pink post-it saying, to accompany students, the educators and staff must of course be trained, but also have enough time outside their working hours to support students there. And uh, um, because they are dedicating time to support students, their working time should be diminished. So yeah, sometimes uh, they're just, uh, there's just a lack of time and uh, this prevents teachers from uh, uh, helping students engage. Yeah. Uh, if does anybody want to comment on this or maybe uh, talk about another uh, sticky note that they deem uh, relevant for the discussion? Uh, yeah, go jump in, Pete. <laughs> uh, 
when when we were tackling the this specific part of the of the program, this was very important because acknowledging the point that that uh, was shared now by uh, Francesca is that many times when when we refer to VT teachers or professors, we think that they're the only educators within the system. But as we see in the second session, it's very important to acknowledge that there is training for the in-school educators but we cannot expect everything from them. And that's where organizations like, for example, Obesu, like where do the student unions play a role in this? Like if you cannot yourself as an institution provide within the, the system itself training for the, uh, the academic staff, training for the, um, the management and training, you know, all these things that are always coming either for digital needs, either for inclusion or diversity or whatever. It's very important to understand how <clears throat> how the minimum standards are set. And I, and, and I go back to the culture, like if you create an open community, an open institution, if you need a training for people with disabilities and how they can engage, if you want uh, activities or, or processes to engage while out of the school community, you also need to be aware of how to engage and with who to engage when out of the school community. And I think that's the important part of understanding from, from your entry point by providing an open school community and, a, and, a, and having a whole school approach, it provides the sentiment and, and, and type of thinking of saying like, I don't need to ask the principal or the, I don't know, the management or, or the professor for something that I would like to see, but there are also ways that we cooperate and do an activity as students or we could ask our, our uh, professor for a certain partnership with an organization, but this as well needs a sentiment of, of the school allowing such an engagement to take place, which many times is not the case. Like you have this blockage, whatever happens in school has to be provided by school uh, resources or, or stakeholders, which for me many times comes in contrast to the VT sector. Like that's what I find more easy in the VT sector versus the, the general uh, uh, school system because you are in a way with one foot in your institution and one foot with a with a company or a learning process which is much easier for you to be exposed to different stakeholders you know thank, thank you Pete, for your contribution and uh, i see <laughs> that uh, alicia would like to contribute so alicia you the floor is yours uh, thank you. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, coming back to... We to, cannot to hear you. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Perfect now. Thank you. Cool. Uh, so I would just like to come back to, uh, to the teachers and um, to the well-made point that they cannot be... Uh, not all the pressure can be put on them, although they play a crucial role, absolutely. Um, we have to be aware also of the background of um, the majority of teachers is that is very different to high schools. Uh, usually teachers in high schools come from university education, where the education also is uh, more uh, dedicated to equality, inclusion, and stressed, while the others in that usually come from engineering technical programs. Uh, they don't have that background. They, I, I, I'm not saying that they are uh, less prone to equality and inclusion, but they are perhaps, um, their sensibility to it is less developed um, and it has to be much more worked on, stressed, how to recognize, uh, how to identify students, etc. It's not that they don't want to, they just don't know how. And mostly in most of uh, um, uh, situations, they misinterpret, uh, as Panayotis mentioned before, um, and define those students as, um, well, usually like problematic ones, uh, um, uh, which leads to exclusion really instead of inclusion. So, uh, um, and usually vetted institutions 
are, the, are much less funded than high schools, although they need much more funding. Uh, only if we look at it from the side of inclusion, as I mentioned, from because most students that um, are in need of support are in bad schools. The, the, the percentage of students in need of, uh, uh, as, as we would define them, the, the uh, oh my God, I missed the word. How did we define them in our project? <laughs> as the one uh, underrepresented, yes, sorry. With the underrepresented students, yes, so. Uh, the underrepresented students are in much higher levels, like definitely at least double the percentage as in high schools, then the, the staff is definitely less um, supported and has less uh, background on it. And uh, in comparison to high schools, vet schools have to do a lot of investments into new technology, new equipment, etc. But they are usually less funded. So this is really uh, a difficult situation that we put them in front. And now that we see all over Europe a problem with teachers on all levels, you can imagine what the situation is in vet schools where you cannot find a teacher anywhere. You can not just take a parent in to teach them, I don't know, like uh, primary school mathematics. Those are engineering professional um, experts. So it's really difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alicia. Um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't, uh, like this resonates uh, with everything that uh, has been said before and I think it also resonates with this other um, comment about the fact that teachers need, uh, not just teachers, but everybody in the, um, among the school staff need uh, continuous training, uh, they need uh, to uh, continuous upskilling. Uh, and continuous learning because this is cru crucial for keeping the curriculum relevant and for personal skill enhancement. Uh, it's totally true, the, the pressure should not be left uh, only on teachers. It should be, um, schools should take a holistic approach and um, also involve the students themselves and um, start a culture of trust where also students feel like um, uh, telling themselves what they need and uh, letting the teachers know how they can be best supported. And I think your comment about lack of resources and lack of funding leads to uh, group four. Uh, if you could, yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, this was uh, this group is about how to make VET institutions more inclusive and how to invest in participatory processes. So how to give the agency to students and uh, help them contribute themselves to make their institutions more inclusive. Um, I will leave the floor to anyone who feels like contributing. For now, I don't see any signs. Let me see if there's something in the chat. Um, if I just come back to the to the finance. Yeah, thank you. For example, OECD um, for our country, Slovenia, uh, um, and the the reports show that, for example, the 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 primary and uh, high school level in Slovenia are budgeted like over one, a bit over uh, uh, the average of OECD. Higher education is around 88%. Uh, VAT uh, is on 34%. So you see a huge gap, a huge gap in the difference, how in average in some countries, I'm not saying in all, but in some countries, uh, really, that is really underfinanced. 
and then expecting them to do wonders. And also if we come back to counselors uh, support uh, that um, years ago, uh, this was well um, organized. Um, there was a counselor, uh, not only career counselor, but also a psychologist in every vet school. That funding was cut. And this shows uh, really uh, also on the um, dropout level in vet schools, which is very high, especially in the first year. And also in vet schools, you see a, a, a larger percentage of, for example, students that come from um, a migrating background that need also language support. Uh, which is also not financed uh, and um, dealt with. Okay, that would be for the start. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, for uh, kicking off the discussion regarding uh, uh, this topic. Uh, yeah, in fact, sometimes uh, uh, when even when the schools take the initiative, then they... Uh, uh, they see themselves uh, uh, with resources cut. And this is a real uh, uh, pity because, uh, it, I mean, then obviously this discourages uh, um, teachers to then take the initiative again and uh, uh, be able to truly support students. Um, and definitely there should be more coordination at uh, the uh, higher levels uh, and, uh, for example, with the Ministry of Education uh, and uh, like the people who have uh, a say in how the fundings are distributed. And these discussions should definitely include uh, the school staff because they are the ones who know where resources uh, should be uh, allocated. Um, another comment that I see uh, that I see as um, like that could be interesting is uh, that, for example, support should be available within VET school for the possibility to set up student-led organizations. This is, uh, for example, one of the way that also the uh, inclusive inclusive pro uh, project has identified as uh, um, encouraging student engagement to look at student organizations themselves. Um, if anybody has. Uh, any anything to say regarding this point or all the other points mentioned on the Jamboard is welcome to take the floor. Then I will do it again. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, so um, for example, the student organizations in Slovenia are very well organized. Uh, probably we have one of the strongest uh, uh, organizations like student organizations in, um, in Europe, um, which is very good. The problem is that uh, uh, they are mostly led by um, uh, high school students and university students. And again, vet students uh, and professional um, higher education students or vocational higher education students really have specific needs that are not really articulated well. We as an association of colleges are working with the student organization here, but sometimes we are uh, ourselves astonished when we uh, communicate with our students <laughs> um, because they are so happy we're where they are uh, sometimes so satisfied and for example the the euro student uh, 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 survey clearly shows that uh, vocational college students are much happier and much satisfied although they uh, come from a, a totally lower economic background uh, have much more problems may be social, economic, etc., but they are much more satisfied and much happier. But when we ask them about engagement and how they could contribute, etc., also on higher, broader levels, um, 
we would say that very few of them even think of it. They are happy in their microenvironment, contributing to that microenvironment. And at the end, if they feel uh, that they are contributing to their environment, good. As long as they are satisfied with it uh, and support each other there, I think it's good. But it is difficult sometimes to find good advocates on a higher level that really come from bad schools. Those are really very few shiny uh, examples. And that's where we have a difficulty in comparison to university students <laughs> where you have the whole uh, population of the philosophical university, et cetera, to, to, to cope with. Thank you again, Alicia, for your comment. And ah, I see that Nika would like to take the floor. Yes, just, just to elaborate a little bit on that point, because I, that's one that I wrote about uh, having support for setting up student-led organizations. I just want to emphasize that when I think about that, it's, it, it's in a very broad sense. So this is not only about um, setting up like a student union Although I think that every um, every school, no matter what level, should have one uh, or student representative body, but also just initiatives that can come from students who want to create something which makes them feel more more comfortable, more belonging. So you can think about something like uh, setting up a LGBT uh, association, or but also maybe a, a regional group for 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 learners from your own region if you are like far away from from your school um but also and i always have to think about this example that i learned quite recently uh from one school uh, where they where they where they set up uh, a group of students who were into gaming so uh where they just shared the passion for gaming and those tend those tend to be students who were not so very much involved in anything else but by having that group they they felt more like they belonged in in their in their school environment it helped them make more friends etc um and when it comes to facilitation um sometimes it can be as easy as having some spaces available it can be about um, maybe guiding learners into where can you find maybe some some funding uh, maybe there are some little funding available so i want to see this as a very broad sense and more linked to the, as I said, the, the sense of belonging and initiative, uh, um, doing things outside your studies and not just about student representative in a more traditional sense. Absolutely. Um, definitely. Um, yeah, the let's say the forms of student engagement are um, several and uh, we should also go beyond uh, the... Um, the, the traditional concept of student-led organizations, as Nick mentioned, uh, uh, this could be, for example, like gaming associations or anything that uh, can make the students uh, feel more connected and uh, feel a sense of belonging to, to their schools, but also some anything that can make them uh, connect with their uh, peers more. Mm -hmm. Um, I will uh, now leave the floor to Pete, who wanted to do a wrap up of uh, uh, all the groups. And um, yeah, I'll take the floor after again for the closing. Thank you very much, Francesca. I think uh, it's important as we wish to, to publish a follow up report after the activity. What we see from the each group basically is uh, covering the, the aspects of how do we understand the challenges and, and um, opportunities in a way of within VT and beyond VT? As, uh, as Alicia was saying many times, like there are a lot of things which are unbalanced and there are a lot of uh, processes which should be different, yet it, it feels that we expect too much from VT uh, sector and, and having commission today was one of these reasons that you have set a lot of strategies, but then you have no power to either uh, push monitor finance or or you know hold member states accountable hold national governments accountable which for me is like as a as a as a part uh when we we also work on the on the education part uh, when it comes to the the european level we say that we cannot discuss about cooperation and investment in learners and educators while this is not a competence uh for example this should be more investment at, at European level, but also more 
significance at European level to be able to address common challenges, but also to be able to acknowledge different challenges. And I think that's one of the main problems uh, many times that even uh, being aware that there are different challenges, uh, but we never talk about it because uh, there's going to be the name and shame process, which I think is quite, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's good when we do it, but at the other day, there are challenges that exist at different local levels and we should accept as well that is a reality. On the other level is un understanding the, the reason. Uh, okay, uh, we're wrapping up anyways in, in a minute. Uh, but thank you very much, Alicia. Like, I really enjoyed your, your inputs. Uh, but on the other side, we need to acknowledge as well, like, we need uh, on one side the PT uh, key stakeholders, or let's say inner stakeholders, to be active when it comes to providing opportunities, setting opportunities, providing information, uh, and, and creating uh, traditional and alternative channels of engagement for students. But it's very important as well to acknowledge that students themselves have the right and can have the the um, the motivation to engage if proper support is needed like if i'm financially struggling as a student and i want to see change coming in my community i'm not going to be that much active because i have no time and uh, and um, let's say support to do that so there's also different elements and aspects when it comes to really inclusive and I think that's where the, the key point covers uh, the whole process that we're doing that. It's not just engaging students, it's making sure that you provide the elements that the learner can enjoy their educational process. They can really engage within their professional learning, but also their personal learning within their community. And I think the wrap up of these four parts is, means that we need to acknowledge the methods, the approaches, the tools, and their resources, which is very important many times, but we, we always neglect it. And that can doesn't have to be only financing resources. It can be also what uh, Nick was saying, like information on how to do things, uh, or what uh, Enrique was saying, ways you provide information, if it's going to be, you know, on a paper or uh, recording, I think uh, that's something that we're going to put out in the in the follow-up report after the, the activity, showcasing that there is many paths and ways. And I think the more important part is understanding as well, that the impact and the wish, the change we wish to see in VT does not only come from VT. It goes beyond. It goes in educational uh, cross sectoral approach and uh, uh, different layers of uh, stakeholders, and for sure, um, being together in, in changing this uh, matters a lot. Uh, thank you, Philippe, uh, and I hope uh, we hope you enjoyed the the activity. But I'm giving the last uh, uh, part to Francesca. Thank you, Pete, for wrapping up the learnings uh, from uh, the uh, third session. And um, thank you, everyone, for having contributed to the Jamboard. Thank you, everyone, for having... Um, uh, thank you to the speakers. Thank you, all for, thank you, all the participants, for having attended uh, this peer learning webinar. Um, we hope you enjoyed. We really enjoyed being part of these uh, fruitful discussions. And um, uh, please uh, uh, stay tuned for the publication of the mapping report. Follow the, um, the website for uh, further news on the project. And um, you will receive soon an email with uh, the materials shared uh, during the during the webinar as well as the notes from uh, the uh, breakout for, from the sessions three and the group discussions thank you so much everyone and we wish you a lovely afternoon and uh, also a nice lunch <laughs> thank you for the invitation goodbye thank you very much have a nice day bye thank you so much thank you. have a nice day bye, -bye.